Hello again, everybody, and welcome to one of those days editions of the Jim Cornette Experience. Spring is sprung. WWE wrestlers have been sprung, and my nerves are more than a little strained. And now to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's the honey to my vinegar, the feather to my spike. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. The feather to your spike. That actually, Dr. Tom Pritchard coined that at one of Sal Corrupt's, I mean Corinthi's uh wrestle <laughs> <laughs> wrestle reunion show like 15 years ago. We're all at the hotel and Jimmy Hart's there. And we're in Florida, so he's local, but he's at the convention. And so me and Jimmy are sitting in the corner of the restaurant. I'm having a cheeseburger. I don't know if he ate. I mean, he eats like a bird and he sleeps four hours a night and he will outlive all of us. But anyway, we're sitting in the corner and Dr. Tom Pritchard comes in and he's, I can't remember what it was, but he's frantic about something. That's because it, it was, you know, a day with a Y in it at, at certain time of AM or PM. Doc's usually frantic, or at least he was in those days. And but then he sees me and Jimmy and we chime in our opinions on whatever it was that he was frantic about. And then he starts laughing because, of course, I immediately jumped in with, yeah, I wish that motherfucker would get run over by a train. Whereas Jimmy's like, well, you know, the guy, he, came in. <laughs> he said, me and Jimmy Hart sitting together are like the feather and the spike. <laughs> Jimmy's, I love you, poo poo. And I'm like, I'd like to strangle that son of a. Anyway, you're a feather. To my spike, you lighten things here on, on days like mama said there'd be days like this. There'd be days like this. Mama said, my mama said. Who did that? Who was that? Oh, you know Name what? that artist. I don't know off the top of my head. Mama said there'd be days like this. There. All right, somebody needs to. Well, we can find it out right now. I mean, it's not like it's going to take that long. Well, somebody do the research. Somebody. here in, in viewership land. Fuck, I don't know what I'm talking about. You do the goddamn research. What do you do around here? Oh, okay, it's the Shirelles. It's the Shirelles. The, it's the Shirelles. There you go. This is the second time we've talked about the Shirelles in three weeks. Well, see, they're on everybody's mind. Soldier on the boy. tip of everybody's tongue. I wish the Shirelles were on the tip of my tongue all the time, but nevertheless. Um... It, well, you know, on days when I run the show and you just hold its head, I have to come up with everything. It's not like over on the drive through when it's your show and I just follow you. And I just follow Charlie. From Starkville all the way back to Mississippi. Um, as I mentioned, uh, spring has sprung and the dogwoods and the red buds are in bloom at Castle Cornet. This is the time where usually of year where I usually tweet a photo of the beautiful, the expansive, 40 foot wide canopy of the pink and white dogwood or the beautiful brilliant purple of the red buds but actually as you know brian i i still get a tickle out of some people when i tweet something they don't like they go they tweet back put your phone away which means they have no idea who have never listened to one of these programs i've yet to ever tweet <laughs> on a telephone and if I if I tweet a picture, it's because I'm either retweeting it or Stacy does it for me. So, but she's had the surgery, and I don't want to ask her to walk the length of the house out in the yard and around the bend, up the alley and down the creek, to take a picture. So I I told her I said, get give me your phone, and turn the camera gimmick on, and I'll go out and take the picture and bring it back to you, and you can tweet it. Right? This seemed like something that could be i'm a great photographer i have excellent composure of my photographs so she turns it and i go out there and i take three or four pictures and i bring it back and she said you didn't take anything i said what you said press the goddamn the round white yeah well i was pressing it well it'll show you the picture well it didn't sh all right so i go back out and i do it and it then it starts making a bing bing noise bing I said, usually it, it makes a click, click noise like a camera, but it's blink, but it's making a noise. So I bring it back. She said, you didn't take anything. I said, well, God damn it. Now the one, 
you know the two weeks that I've had here and, and a little over with the action figures and the surgeries and the fucking weather and the goddamn Monroe brothers and the whole nine yards. You're aware of the franticness here. Now I'm the one peaceful moment where Jim Cornette is trying to go out in his yard and take a picture of a beautiful flowering tree and share it with the goddamn, and now I'm huffing and puffing. I'm going 150 feet each way back and forth in to tell her it's not taking a picture. And then I said, T I defy you. Take a picture right now, pressing that same button I was pressing. You know what she did? She took a picture right then, pressing the same <laughs> button I was pressing. I said, well, what the fuck? And so anyway, the the pictures may be delayed this year for the, but I haven't had time to be on Twitter hardly anyway uh, lately. Uh, but, and speaking of uh, Stacy's surgery, I want to thank Frank the Collector, our friend Frank. Oh, great guy! Sent a wonderful get well present, and not that I've mentioned some of the other people that haven't. Not that everybody's hasn't been wonderful, but this was this was right there and in, in a perfect choice because it he sent a ceramic Elvira bust salt and pepper shaker set where the salt and pepper shakers double as Elvira's pulchritudinous upper frontal protuberances. So it's perfect. And she's already got it. She's actually not going to put salt and pepper in it. She, we, we set it in the TV room on the shelf there in a place of prominence. But anyway. Who wrote the first national story on Elvira in a monster magazine? Forrest J. Ackerman? Dan Farron. Dan Farron! Holy my, our Dan, the wrestling Dan Farron. The wrestling Dan, the late Dan Farron, because, the of course, Mike Leno twice announced that he was dead on the ring. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I was going to say, wait a minute, I didn't hear. <sighs> well, you know, if you do it three times, it comes true. It wasn't just like, oh, he died. It was, and the late Dan Farron, who we all miss so much. <laughs> He was sitting at home listening to this. <laughs> uh. But no, but no, it's just actually, that's just what Dan told Leno. He just sent one of the died so Leno to leave him alone. You remember that? Did I ever told you how the time Dutch Mantel gave his notice in Puerto Rico one time? I don't know. He, you know, every, every, even big star or any American that spent a long enough time in Puerto Rico, even when the money was good and business was good or Dutch was the booker or whatever the face sooner or later, you get, he called it Island fever and you got to come back home. You can't just stay there constantly forever, but he, he had to get out of there, but he's fucking, he's figured out a way that he could tell Carlos so that he can just get off and get off the Island without them doing the thing where see, sometimes, they would get behind in your money two or three weeks. And they'd say, oh, you know, next week. And next week would never, and you didn't want to leave. You might leave on a week, but you didn't want to leave on two or three weeks or a month or whatever, right? So anyway, Dutch, to get out of there with no heat, told him that his house in Nashville had burned down and he had to go home. <laughs> and then when he got there, he had all his money and everything. He sent word that he'd had a heart attack and died. <laughs> <sighs> but anyway um almost as good as terry fun quitting the wwf by leaving a note on vince's door that his horse was sick his horse was sick. <laughs> i was there i saw the note vince still had the note in his hand when he showed up at the production meeting that morning vince i i can't remember the exact verbiage but sorry vince would have loved to have done your show but i have to take care of a sick horse terry something to that effect because that's when he, he, what was that? What year was it? The Survivor Series? That was 93. Was, that's right. Yeah. He was going to be the, uh, one of the masked minions of Lawler. Um, or how did it go? Cause they changed that fucking thing six times. Cause wasn't that when Lawler got in some trouble? It was supposed to be Lawler. And then Lawler got into his legal trouble and he was pulled off TV. And Sean had quit a little bit before that, and I believe that was the opportunity the first time to convince him to come back, and that was the first time he came back. So who were the t who were the teams? What was the combination? It was Somehow Terry was going to be some yeah, massive yeah. dumb shit, and he didn't mind that for a pay-per-view payoff until he found out they were going to take his mask off. I believe it was Brett, Keith, Bruce, and Owen 
versus yeah. Lawler's team. Well, it was supposed to be Lawler of these masked knights. And it ended up being Greg Valentine, I think, Jeff Gaylord, and maybe Barry Horowitz or someone filling in for Terry. But Terry yeah. was supposed to be the third masked but that's, guy. With that's Jeff Gaylord we- and Greg Valentine. Because because the the Brett and Lawler had been having the the feud where Lawler made fun of Stu and Helen and etc. So that was going to be the big deal. And Lawler had to get a family, so he had mass nights. And then when Lawler was taken out of it, Sean came back to get the chance to fuck with Brett. Uh, but yeah, Terry did because I don't know. I was not in the office at that point yet. I was I was up there, and I was coming in as a talent. But how in the world that they booked Terry Funk to be just some, you know, masked guy and then thought that they could unmask him and show who it was and he was going to go for that, I guess, what did they think? When he when he was already there and he made the trip? Well, why not? You know, I never could figure that out. And it was the greatest thing. It was like, sorry, I think he, I think he had a sick horse a couple of times in his career. Yeah, I think when he left in 86, his horse got sick also. <laughs> but it, it, at least, but poor Abdullah, his mother passed away, what, at least 11 or 12 times. Uh, I didn't realize he was known for pulling that one. I thought, wasn't it Abdullah's mother? Or was it his grandmother? I don't know. It was a member of the family. Anyway. Well, you've got me in a better mood than I was when I almost, when we started this fucking thing. You know, I realize I've been too sour lately and I'm, I'm going to actually admit it in some semblance of a way, which is the closest thing you folks are ever going to get. Let's face it, that I was wrong about something here lately as later on in the program, but I've been sour lately and you know, it's been a stressful couple of weeks, uh, but I realized over the last week. And I I know what set me over the edge. What of these things? We'll talk about it. But last week, we recorded, well, not last week. It's the first of this week now. The last program that we recorded was the drive through where we talked about WrestleMania. So between Sunday, Sunday night, I watched the first night of WrestleMania so I could fast forward through the entrances, which saves the better part of half the program. And then Sunday morning or Monday morning, I'd watch the other half after going to the post office. And as we jovially, uh, jovially talked about shipping like a hundred fucking boxes at my advanced age, you got to see about I'll, I'll, when I get to fucking this morning, we'll talk about that. Um, that. So then I came back and watched night two and then we recorded the show. So it's like six to eight hours of, what they call wrestling these days and, and, and physical activity followed by talking about that alleged wrestling again. So then this past week, I feel, well, I'll, I'll make up some time because we don't have to record between Monday and Friday. So I got to make up some time on the action figures. The people are tweeting out there. The people, Brian are tweeting. It can happen to you. Hashtag. It can happen to you. They're showing pictures of their figures. There is proof that I'm actually engaging in this activity. So over Tuesday, I sign and pack and label 80-something two packs of figures. That's like 160-plus figures, right? And And I load them in the truck. I know that Wednesday morning when I go to the post office, it's going to be raining. So I tan these these two packs of figures go in a crush-proof cardboard box 12 by 9 by 3. So if you've got 80-something of those boxes, imagine how much space that takes up. What I do is I put those boxes all stacked together in bigger boxes so that I can, you know, as big as I can carry, and then it's easier to stack on the dolly. But I've got like, say, 10 of those boxes goes each one of these bigger boxes. I've got like eight or nine of these giant boxes loaded in Black Beauty, a full-size Ford Expedition, along with the dolly, plus my gloves, my antiseptic, my post office ninja outfit, my mask, the whole nine yards. And I've got it loaded in on Tuesday night so that that way I won't, uh, I won't have to fuck around in the rain on Wednesday morning. I just hop in the car and take off. So Wednesday morning, 8.45, it's raining. 
I fucking run out and I, I'm starting to jump in the truck. I realize, wait a minute, I need towels, towels to put over the boxes when I wheel them into the post office because I got to access the handicapped fucking thing up the sidewalk to wheel this goddamn these giant fucking loads in the boxes are as tall as me when they see a, a load of boxes with no human behind it coming through the door lib says to Bree, jim's here so anyway i grab the towels i throw them in the back of the truck i jump in the truck put my gloves on fucking stick the key in the in the fucking ignition turn it <laughs> what the fuck the goddamn battery is dead now i'm shitting because you know all of my I'm, i hate to be late i've got an appointment the pressure is on me to send out these figures anyway i've got a truckload of fucking figures and all i can hear is <laughs> motherfucker so I fucking get out of the fucking truck. Run. I've got AAA Premier Service. Even though I never leave the county anymore, I've still got AAA Premier Service. I get on a fucking phone. I call them. I tell blah, blah, blah. They have somebody come out. That's still raining. Now he's out. He's got the fucking lid up checking the battery. I'm standing out there in the driveway for no good reason getting wet. Otherwise, then, God damn it, can I still make the fucking post office? Because I got a window. Because when the passport appointments start, and here's another thing about the United States Post Office, Brian, not to digress, you get your passports there also, but do you know that they do not have, at least at every branch, specifically the one I go to, a dedicated person to issue and take applications for it, et cetera, and deal with these passports? Every time some knucklehead wants to go to fucking Greece or even just a little hot water, he has to make an appointment and they got to break a window clerk loose to do like a 15, 20 minute passport procedure instead of processing actual parcels because they're too cheap to have a separate office. Did you know that? I did. I did know that. Well, how'd you fucking know that? How did I know that there's not a dedicated person for just passports? Yes. I've noticed that every single time I've been in the post office. Well. And there's someone there looking for a passport. Well, I tell you what, I would never have dreamed that. I thought there there should be somebody for these type of things. But anyway, the point is, if I don't get there by a certain time, then I can't get my clerk for an hour and just, and it ruins everybody's day. Um, So anyway, but of course, by the time the guy finishes, yeah, that battery's bad. We got to get the other battery. Da, 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 da. I've missed my window. So I'm just standing there like a goddamn wet rat. Anyway, and they asked me not to come on Thursday because of being shorthanded and April 15th, even though that the government has changed the tax filing deadline. They knew a lot of people might not know that, and they, they were, as a matter of fact, quite hectic. But nevertheless, those figures shipped this morning. More on that later. So that's my fuck. So I buckled down on Wednesday and Thursday and packed up another bunch of figures, but then found out that my cousin has been in the hospital. When he called me and said, hey, I'm in a hospital. So I called him back and said, what the, what the fuck happened? And he told me, and I still don't know, his electrolytes were imbalanced and his sodium was low. What does that mean? I don't know, but that'll do it. Well, whatever. And, he, and he's, uh, he's a lot older than me. So anyway, I was dealing with that, and of course, uh, um, Stacy, you know, is is getting up and about uh, around the house, but she's still not allowed to lift anything or run after the dog or pick anything up or whatever the fuck. So I'm doing that. Then I tried to call my prescription in, Brian, my just regular old blood pressure. Imagine that me on blood pressure medication. I call the pharmacy, you know, where you usually just call them up and enter in the number and the. The pharmacy's automated phone line says the store can't accept calls at this time. Try again later. If you're a store employee, please report this. <laughs> what the fuck? I can't get my prescription. And then it just hung up on me. And then also, uh, uh, Thursday, I had to watch All Friends Wrestling and 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 deal with that. And then this morning, 
was at the post office shipping the hundred and whatever fucking figures plus another few that I jammed in the truck and have more stuff to take in the morning. Because as I mentioned, the the size and, and weight of the things at my advanced age, so nothing's been going right. Is I feel like Rodney Dangerfield. I woke up this morning. I opened the door. The doorknob fell off. I picked up my suitcase. The handle fell off. I'm afraid to take a piss. <laughs> <sighs> but so the moral of the story is that I may not be in the proper mood to watch and or fairly critique modern wrestling in my current state of mind, but we, we will still give it a try, but, um, but I'm just about fed up. I'm losing my religion. REM didn't invent that. That's an old Southern saying for, I about lost my patience with you, motherfucker. When you, I'm losing my religion with you. Uh, but you know what? The people I'm not re losing religion on, or I am losing sleep on them, is my action figure customers. Folks, we're chipping away at it. Uh, we're still filling the two packs, which are better than half of these orders to get that all came in in total. And getting these, we're shipping... As I mentioned, three or four days a week, got a brand new battery now, and uh, out of the, what, 1,300 or so, probably 700 and something or individual orders remain, have patience, and I'm, I'm doing this as quickly as I can, and I appreciate all the patience that you are having. You know, the, the people at the post office said, boy, that is a lot of trust these people have in you. That uh, that they just wait so long because these are handcrafted items, hand done with love and care, and sometimes venom and vitriol. You can even sometimes people have said they've had to wipe some of the venom and vitriol off of the label to see their name clearly when they get their package. <laughs> what are you giggling about? Well, you're just so funny. I'm going. Oh, see what the fuck are oh, you? Oh, you're just such a jolly. <gasps> <laughs> I don't know what that's why I'm saying I don't know what I'm doing I'm under a lot of mental strain I mean it's like a heaviness you know I wake up every morning I feel it it's on me I go high heaviness and the heaviness says ah it's gonna be a day like no other you're gonna be drinking early today what's your favorite Rodney movie I it has to be Caddyshack just for the the sentimental nature of everyone before Chevy Chase got to be a stick in the mud and Bill Murray was classic and it was Rodney's first big, big screen turn. I mean, not the first movie ever, but the, the, you know, he stole the fucking show there. It, and so it has to be that, but I just liked his stand up and just sitting there and having a fucking nervous breakdown on the, on the tonight show It's fucking, but see, that's, Everybody uh, may think I'm crazy, but there are more direct correlations between the early days of show business and pro wrestling than people realize. And it was the 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 comics of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They was they were so quick and they were so good. Obviously, the Carlins and the Priors and everything, uh, all uh, to Mars. They've surpassed them in terms of the the skill of their verbiage and et cetera. But these guys were sharp and they could come up with anything because they played the fucking cat skills, right? And you couldn't stump them and they could get in and out of everything. Maury Amsterdam, the human joke machine, right? Give me a topic, batteries. And he'd do five battery jokes. You know, that's, it's the same thing of what, what you have lost in a lot of cases with modern entertainment as well is the experience of all of those performers doing things in front of a live audience uh, time after time, night after night, year after year, nobody gets that doing it. I mean, before the pandemic, nobody gets that doing anything anymore, which and, and the ones, the live performances, sometimes that you get, no matter what the genre are so fancy and fabricated and choreographed and produced and overproduced and etc. that you're, you know, I think the, some of the best comics didn't translate to the movies well, because it was just them sitting there or standing there being funny fucking people. Right. 
and playing off an audience. Nevertheless, how did you get me started there? I was trying to get you in a good mood. Well, I was in a good mood, and then you worked me back out of it, thinking about what we've lost. We're going to talk about some of the things <laughs> we've lost in wrestling, too. But, fuck, you know, I'm, a, I'm under a lot of stress, for heaven's sake. If only we had a, a sponsor that could help people that need somebody to talk to to eliminate stress. If only we had somebody like that that advertised on the program so we could readily convey that information to other people, Brian. Well, luckily we do, Jim. Well, thank you. Oh, <laughs> gong of Fu Manchu. I have no idea how that fit into this tra transition, but nevertheless, we'll go with it. Folks, if there's something interfering with your happiness besides a late middle-aged fat wrestling manager from Kentucky uh, or preventing you from achieving your goals, better help. We'll assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist that you can start communicating with in under 48 hours. We've been talking about the folks, uh, these folks here on the program for some time. We've had emails from a lot of the listeners that said they just, they didn't want to go out in public during the pandemic or they don't have counseling in their area that they can do in person. And this is worldwide. Uh, it's a broad range of expertise with the therapists available. You can log into your account anytime, send messages to your counselors, and you can schedule weekly video and phone sessions. Uh, so you do not have to leave the house. Anyway, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed, and it's more affordable than the traditional offline counseling, i.e. in person. If you visit BetterHelp.com, you can read some of the testimonials that are posted from clients every day and if you go to betterhelp.com you can read the testimonials that they post daily from some of their clients and if you go to betterhelp that's h-e-l-p by the way betterhelp.com slash j-c-e you can get 10 percent off your first month's services so join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional go to betterhelp.com slash j-c-e this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and the Jim Cornette Experience listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash JCE. I need, you know what? Somebody needs to just do some kind of study on me. I think they could probably retire on that. What do you think? I think there's lots of people that would be curious about the results. Um, very curious results. Actually, I had my head examined one time. They found absolutely nothing. All right, speaking of people with rocks in their heads, did you hear Pat McAfee is going back to the WWE? I did hear that. I didn't know we consider him someone with rocks in his head. No, I consider the WWE someone with rocks in their head. Ah, makes more sense. They bring the guy who, and for, all, for everybody who thought Bugs Bunny had the greatest debut match in history, the best debut match in history, if it wasn't Ronda Rousey's, was Pat McAfee, and they're bringing him back as an announcer. Does he not want to wrestle? Could Can they not, that guy, that personality, that promo that he can cut, the name and the followers that he has, the performance that he put in, in as a wrestler with you know obviously a lot of private training but no experience in front of people whatsoever they can't figure out a way to say hey pat wrestle six eight times for us this coming year all in key money draw well they don't draw money anymore but in key spots on whatever they consider big shows and make some tv appearances to lead up to those and we'll pay you X amount of dollars. And then, because he's, I don't know how old he is, but you don't want, maybe he doesn't want to wrestle forever, or maybe he doesn't want to wrestle more than once in a while, but gets, this guy can fucking, whatever the modern equivalent is of drawing money these days, Pat McAfee can do it better than most people on their roster. And they're going to just right away make him an announcer. And, and, and I know some people as well, he can wrestle later. Well, why not? Why not? He, he was a 
an anti-authority guy. He was doing his own shit. He he comes off as a guy who does not need the WWE. Brian, do you ha, can you name a lot of wrestlers these days that are presented as if they don't need the company and the company ought to be lucky that they showed up? Oh, no. It's usually the exact opposite. Everyone should be very yes. lucky and thankful that they're actually employed by the McMahons. Or any, or any of the other promotions. Actually, when you think about it, it's everybody, oh, it's always been my dream to win the, you know, uh, Cornhole Championship here in fucking Iowa on Iowa Championship Wrestling. It, it, Pat McAfee comes in and says, I'm a fucking multimillionaire and I just flew my plane down here and I've got all this money and I don't, f and fuck you. And he's great. He's a great television personality. He was, he was excellent in the ring. Why not figure out some way to tap into that and run it for a year, year and a half, or whatever the fuck, on a part-time basis so he doesn't get overexposed and or he obviously does have other things to do. I, I, as an announcer, just, well, let's bring him right in here. What do you think? Maybe Vince is a big fan of the way Georgia used Roddy Piper for the first several months. <laughs> I will kiss your ass on Broadway at noon if Vince McMahon has ever watched a clip of Roddy Piper on Georgia Championship Wrestling unless it was on a WWF DVD release sometime 20 years later. Other than that, I don't have a good explanation for this. Pat McAfee is someone who in NXT exuded a star quality that was Fantastic. Good promo. Was great in the ring. Did the right things in the ring. Was a heat magnet. There aren't too many guys today. MJF, McAfee, who instantly can get heat just by talking. So let's make him a commentator with Michael Cole. That'll beat the spirit out of him. <laughs> oh my God. He's going to fucking browbeat Michael Cole into unconsciousness. If he's allowed to. We can only hope. We can only hope. Now, what... what <laughs> Maybe that ought to be the WrestleMania match next year. Everybody keeps talking about, I want to see Cornette and Russo in a death match. I think you and Michael Cole, I think you can take him. Oh, I know I could, but I also don't think I want to be on WrestleMania. And I don't think I want to give him the rub, quite frankly. Because he sucks. Well, here's the thing. You don't, you don't have to rub him. You could just, you could just, well, I guess, you know, if you wanted to, you could cover him like at, at, girl covered randy orton but then suzanne would get mad that girl alexa bliss that girl whichever i couldn't remember her that name. girl the, the small child <laughs> that with the creepy music and and that that vomits you pea soup and i don't know linda blair was hotter i didn't send you the clip because i was like you know i as much as i think the listeners would want to hear jim talk about this i kind of know what he's gonna say this will put him in a bad mood but apparently on Raw, Alexa Bliss was in her swing set, her honor swing set, and revealing that she realized she didn't need the Fiend anymore. She didn't need his power. She had her own. And then she introduced her little, I guess it's a puppet, this little doll named Lily. Oh, good Lord. So wait a minute. So now she's broken <laughs> loose and she's got her own <laughs> puppet show. It's an outlaw puppet show. And all I'm thinking is this was the perfect chance to just stop all of this and break away stop. from all of this. And they're doubling down on it. It's so, so bad. So well, what's the fiend going to do without his schoolgirl? He's going to obviously feud with Alexa Bliss. <laughs> so, hold on. You okay over there? Uh, just this pain. Every t it's the pain that I get every time I remember where wrestling used to be in my heart. Ah, but so good luck, like, Pat McAfee. Good luck, Pat McAfee, with the brow beating Michael Cole into unconsciousness. Uh, it, and <laughs> do you? It, I was about to say that maybe they they needed somebody because of all the people that they fired and. Uh, Obviously, the biggest name that they just fired was Samoa Joe when he was doing announcing. But before, actually, a side note before we get to that, they've just hired another person 
to be the voice of Raw, correct? I just I saw a press release about this on on one of the sites. So who was the who was the guy that was doing Raw? I don't know who he is. I'm not familiar with him. I believe well, he's I off I ESPN. Guy, I mean, who who did they? Because Samoa Joe was not the the play by play guy. Samoa Joe was color. Todd Phillips was that his name? Tom Phillips. Todd F- Tom Phillips. Okay, is he still there? He's the guy that the day of WrestleMania they took him off the show. at least Samoa Joe they let him work Wrestlemania I believe he's still working there Tom Phillips but he's not currently on air and now they have Corey Graves on Raw and they have Pat McAfee on Smackdown but so the new guy on Raw from what I understand has never done has never announced wrestling he's a big fan he's announced other sports he's never announced wrestling Hey, I'm all for it. It can only be better than what they've been putting out there. But mix it up, do something different. I'm all for it. But don't sh- same thing as the the modern uh, wrestlers slash entertainers slash whoever in general <clears throat> do not get enough experience at the thing that they're supposed to be doing. Even if a guy is an accomplished TV weatherman then do you have him start doing the sports on national news or do it's it's just because he has announced something doesn't mean that he should start announcing another thing, whether he knows that much about it or not on the highest rated weekly show, or I think SmackDown may be beating him now. Second highest rated weekly show of that genre in the goddamn world. Should you put him on something else first just to give him some fucking practice? Why is everybody now they leave wrestling school and they make their debuts on national fucking television or some guy who's announced baseball or whatever the, I can't remember what the fuck it was. Well, let's just put him on the goddamn highest rated show in the world and see how he does. I, I, I don't get that. But anyway, uh, Samoa Samoa Joe is where I was going with this. What the heck? Um, <laughs> why would you... With the, the announcers that they have, and you can't... You need to get rid of Joe first, or is this saying that they are not going to clear him to wrestle again? I know he's had concussion issues, but... Uh, that guy has had a gypsy curse on him for almost 20 years because he should have been 15 years ago. He should have been one of the biggest stars in the business. And I just, it's either where he's been or how they've used him when he's been there has what was the line? And that was over 10 years ago. He said, I tripped on some bad booking. That was in TNA. They fucked him up from scratch. And I never understood how that this is almost a foolproof talent and how a part of it was TNA being just a vastly secondary product at the time and of course to attribute most of that to the creative and we know who that was um but they spectacularly couldn't convert their million and million and a half people on spike into buying the pay-per-views at all because that was creative's least concern uh he didn't book he didn't book at all he didn't write to put uh cards together on pay-per-view that would draw money he you know just fucked up every segment of the show to get gawkers looking at the accident on the side of the road but joe and kurt angle broke through that to do the only pay-per-view that tna ever did they never gave numbers because it's a private company they didn't have to and they were embarrassed about them but even people working in 
the at least you know wrestling end of the company weren't privy to exact numbers or figures or whatever but Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe that first match they had on pay-per-view what was was it September-ish October-ish 2009 November or 2006 rather November-ish maybe I don't remember point is look it up the first one they did a serious build that Dutch Mantel took care of and and that's why they never got to do it again, because it was all Dutch. And they didn't fucking do angles every week. And they played on angles background and, and Samoa Joe's MMA style. And they did, depending on who you want to listen to, uh, somewhere around 40 or 50,000 buys, which was the by far the most successful TNA pay-per-view of all time. And I don't... But unfortunately... The, uh, you know, HTIC, head twat in charge, didn't know wrestling. She just knew con men. So she was allowed to believe that the rotten creative that she was being given should, con should uh, continue instead of business. And they never did that again. And by the, by the time I was gone, remember that Samoa Joe, he came out one time with a goddamn fake tat Samoan tribal tattoo on his face and at one of the pay-per-views that shit stain got his way on I think after after Jeff was gone they brought Samoan fire dancers to bring Samoa Joe to the ring for his entrance on one of the pay-per-views and he told me what he said I've I've got a college education and I'm from fucking California right you know the the Samoa Joe, the whole idea of the Samoa Joe gimmick and Samoa Joe and his personality was that he was an update, a modern version of the wild Samoan in that he wasn't fucking out there eating raw fish with goddamn Lou Albano. He was a fucking college-educated, well-spoken guy that could cut good promos, but had a different physique. He was thick and big, and I know sometimes he got too big because he wasn't motivated, because they were jacking him around. But he was a badass with an MMA-influenced style, and he could smother you with his weight, and he was still a Samoan. So for the natural toughness that they both have and can project in physical situations, so he, and, and he could work. He could work with people where they didn't, they didn't feel he was there unless that they asked him to lay shit in or it called for it because of the fucking angle, but he was an excellent worker, got the fucking picture. Um, and he's another guy that, because that she was so wrapped up in hiring the WWE's over the hill gang that could come in and get a paid vacation. Joe and several other guys at his level suffered for several years and still it, you know, it was also a vastly secondary promotion. But I do believe if he had been presented better in TNA, that he would have probably been taken more seriously from the start in the WWE. But I don't know. I haven't been around for any of his dealings there. I don't know what his relationship with them has been. But, <clears throat> I mean, at this point, with concussions, and they may be looking, I don't even remember how old Joe is. But 42. You know, well, there you go. I mean, you know, he's still he's doing a great job as an announcer and an ex-jock and color guy, better than, you know, most of the fucking goofballs they come up with, but they probably don't want to consider him for an in-ring run in the future, which is a shame because he's got cheated out of 15 years thanks to shit stain and Dixie and the, the you know, he made good guaranteed money there for some time, but it did absolutely nothing for his career and during his prime physical years where he could have been a fucking force. You could use, you could have used the Samoa Joe of the 10, 15 years ago, maybe even five years ago. I haven't kept a close eye. You could have used him in a Brock Lesnar spot in a Jacob Fatu spot in a fucking really dominant powerhouse spot but he wouldn't have needed a a, uh, a heel manager or a corner man or a stable it might have augmented 
but he could speak for himself. And, you know, and I just, I just, it's just a shame guys like that don't come along, uh, you know, every day and nobody has had the first fucking clue what to do with him. Actually, that's not true. And that's the issue, I think, in some ways. Every booker wants to do their own thing, but sometimes you should just copy what works. Gabe Sapolsky knew exactly what Okay, to well, and, and I apologize when I just said, I, 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 and I apologize this ahead of time for Gabe. Nobody where anybody ever saw it has had an idea of what to do with him. I agree. Yeah, yeah Gabe yeah. was perfect. And, and it, it, that doesn't mean that he could... I know a lot of people will say, well, he was so dominant in Ring of Honor at that time because all those guys were small, etc. Well, look at the fucking modern roster anywhere. But also, it was because he was put over properly. And he's a guy, he could work with anybody. Small guys, big guys, whatever. Uh, But I, you know... When did you first see him? Because it must have been eye-opening to you. It was so different. What was happening in the independent scene in the early whatever you would say, the early 2000s was so different than what it had been just a few years earlier, but you got exposed to, I would think, a lot of guys you had never seen before, like a CM Punk or a Samoa Joe. Yeah, and well, it, Punk, I saw a few of his matches early. I only made sporadic dates for Gabe uh, in the early, before, uh, what was it, two, 2004, 2005, I made a few, and then... In 2006, suddenly I I read on the internet or somewhere that all TNA talent had been uh, uh, right a, right after I'd got with TNA that all TNA talent was not going to be being used on Ring of Honor shows anymore. And then I had to call everybody because I'm like, well, what the fuck? Uh, and I don't mean to go off on a side tangent. And I'll get back to this in a second. Basically, my deal with TNA was that I could do anything else I wanted to do besides their television and pay-per-views i gave them first crack at those dates right so i did not i could not be withdrawn and i was enjoying working with gabe and carrie and so i called and tna said no actually you can still do whatever you want but then i called gabe and, I, and he said well here's the fucking thing he said we can't have samoa joe we can't have uh aj styles we can't have this guy but we can still have you will it put heat on you i said you know that's right the fans will probably be pissed so we just didn't do anything for a couple of years um but uh to answer your the original question and how was it exactly that you phrased it again when i first saw these guys joe was joe was not as green um, as some, like the first time I saw the Briscoes, I gotta be honest. Cause I think they were 18 and 20. I said, well, they they were so athletic. They were puppies with big paws, but I, I said that this was straight independent style wrestling. And I was like, Ugh. you know, but then even, even AJ, maybe just to some extent when I first saw him was still a little greenish, but they did get more experience in TNA because they got a chance to work with, uh, you know, with a higher experience level of talent. But I, the, the thing I was going to say was they were the cream of the crop there. Whereas most of ring of honors guys in 2005 ish were just really indie and, really young and really green when i went away for a couple of years and then all of a sudden i went back in 2009 holy shit the briscoes had grown up and so had had a number of the guys that i'd seen before and they but they had gotten older and they'd gotten bigger and they'd gotten more experience and it, the the a, a lot of the the class had grown up there but but yeah that was the thing is that Joe and AJ and those guys and uh, Daniels who I'd known for forever. Cause he was older. The, the independent, the, the main event independent guys then were, were not being silly with wrestling. And then it, there was no invisible man. There was no dance routines. There was nothing phony. They were doing stuff that was maybe a little too fast or maybe a little too Japanese style, but they were doing it at a, at a high level. 
performing it at a high level, doing the the moves, and they were crisp. <clears throat> you know, the, the but the the underneath guys in the mid two thousands, eh, a lot of them were sloppy on the independents. Now, you went through a period where, like it, the the Ring of Honor class in two thousand, what nine to eleven or twelve. Roderick Strong, Davey Richards, who's just coming back, the Briscoes, Jay Lethal, Eddie Edwards, um, guys up and down the card like that. <clears throat> as as we talked about with Joe Coff, they on um, the Independents, they were the best working, most credible guys that weren't signed to WWE or TNA. And you know they were doing the shit at a high level. You know it. it then over the last 10 years since that, it seems like now everybody can do everything, <laughs> but, but nobody, the, none of the end of indie guys take anything seriously anymore. It, 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 so you have these invisible man matches and the dance routines and the invisible choke slams and the, you know, the you know lollipops up the ass all the things that we tweet about and i just wonder is you know is that maybe why is the wwe better off having their own developmental program because at least they don't get people with that do shit like that they start them from scratch because nobody's really getting serious experience on the independence anymore they're all fucking saturday night live sketch comedy shows aren't they and looking at what the independent scene is now samoa joe really stands out for when he rose yeah. up on the independent scene and he was so different than every other guy well yeah samoa joe for these independents now and the you know the high school cheerleaders that uncle dave loves samoa joe would come in like brock lesnar so you know i i Everybody thinks that I always hate the the young guys, the modern talent. No, I was a big proponent of Joe's. I used to, I used to fucking tear my hair out in the in the truck when I would drive Dutch Mantel because I'd drive to the tapings, right? So I'd have my truck. Me and Dutch would go to the studio in Orlando every day and back to the hotel, and I'd be tearing my fucking hair out of my head at whatever they'd done to Samoa Joe or whatever they'd done to Bobby Roode or what. And there's another one. Bobby Roode 15 years ago was Arn Anderson on on independent shows. Find me one of those. So anyway, um yeah, I just I feel bad, bad for Joe in that they let him go if they don't want to use him as a wrestler going forward and if he's had that much issue with concussions, maybe he shouldn't be. Uh but he was certainly doing a at least as good a job as the rest of his competition there as an announcer, and he's well-spoken, and he gives some credibility to the fucking thing. Could he not be a coach in some way at the Performance Center to teach some of these fucking knuckleheads something? I You, you would think. You, yeah. you, but I, So I didn't get that one at all. I really did not. But you know what? You know what he will do, though? He will sleep easier at night knowing that he is not at the behest and the beholden of the evil empire. That's exactly what he'll do. He will Samoa Joe. Now that he is free from the clutches of the evil McMahon empire, he will sleep almost as good as if, if he was stretched out at night on a helix mattress, not quite, but almost as good because we all know, that if you want to feel like you're laying down in a cloud, if you want to feel like you're curled up in the warm belly of a soft puppy, then you need you a Helix mattress. And I told you, that's what Stacy is recuperating and recoverizing right now on from her surgery. That's what you need to go to whenever you're just tired, sore, broke down, and disgusted. Go to a Helix Sleep mattress, folks. You go to helixsleep.com slash JCE, by the way. You take a two-minute sleep quiz. What positions do you like to sleep in? Uh, do you run hot, cold, whatever? And they match you to the customized mattress they offer that gives you the best sleep of your life. It's got a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. If you don't love it, what in the world would be a matter with you? 
uh, they'll even pick it up for you. So you go there, you take the quiz, you tell them how you sleep, what you like, then you order the mattress, it comes to your door in a box that even a normal human can move around, because once you unbox it, poof, it inflates to life with the grace of a flying gazelle. And it's a it's a wonderful show to watch it uh, just pop right up there, too. I haven't seen anything get bigger like that at that rate in a long time, folks. But anyway, helixsleep.com slash JCE, because they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash JCE. Don't sleep on a saggy old mattress or sleep beside a saggy old... No, you get you a brand new mattress from Helix. It won't look like the mattress that Norman Bates' mother slept on with those big ruts in it. She never rolled over in bed. Did you notice that? I did not notice that, no. She was dead already, Jim. <laughs> you sound like bones now. <laughs> She's dead, Jim. Well, Jim, did you see there were other releases? The I WWE. did see this. Would you like to go over some of those too? Did you do you have the names in front of you? I I have some names. Would you like Would you like to name some names? I demand that you name names. I have the I have the names. Do you have the names? I have the names. Who's doing the naming? Tell me of the some names? of your names. <laughs> According to what I have here, Mickey yes. James gone from WWE. And that's obviously she's one of the more talented and experienced girls that they've had on their roster over the last 20 years. Do you go with young, klutzy, ditzy girls that don't know how to grab their ass with both hands, uh, but at least you can have them for 10 years and they might figure it out. Or do you go with the people that actually know what they're doing and have name value and a uh, built in fan base, but you can't have them for 10 more years. I don't know. I would myself would have fired a few more before I'd have fired Mickey, but that's just me. Well, speaking of women on the roster, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce were both released. Okay, well, that settles one question, because I wrote those names down, and I didn't know who either one of those guys were, <laughs> so... <laughs> they were the iconics. Have we seen... Okay, I've... I've. That must have been... Did we ever watch their show? If so, that must have been stuff I fast-forwarded. Their show? We, we've watched their show, yeah. Whatever show they were on, the Raws or the SmackDowns, what show were they on? They were on, I want to say SmackDown, but I don't even know. Okay, I yeah, so I didn't know who Billy was, and I didn't know who Peyton was, but I assumed they were two developmental guys. Also, Chelsea Green. Um, I was upset about that until I realized that it wasn't Chelsea Handler. And I, I wondered where her show has been, has been for the last few years. I love to watch uh, Chelsea Handler's show, but then it, it went off the air. Is it on and Netflix? I, well, that's the same thing as being off the air. It's not Netflix ain't on the air. There's nothing you like enough that if it went off the air, you wouldn't say, you know what? This is it. Stacy, I want Netflix everywhere I go. Well, no, there's some, she's got that shit on some of the TVs and I don't know how to work it and it pisses me off. So there's no show that would leave broadcast TV to go to Netflix that would cause you to say, you know what? I'm going to figure this out. If they start broadcasting unseen video of, of uh, Mid-South Wrestling... Uh, I'll, I'll follow it anywhere. All right. So Jim won't be learning Netflix, but let's get a few more names here on the list. Tucker. <laughs> he was the other mechanic or machinery guy. Not the, the short one that they made a complete comedy stooge. But the uh, the other one didn't it, didn't he have Tucky on his on the ass of his trunks, and 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 it, he was the partner of the guy that uh, didn't he get knocked off the roof of the goddamn Titan Tower during one of those pay per view cinematic things or whatever? Some girl was taking advantage of him. <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> they wore gas station attendant outfits. That's right. That's right. Yeah. See you later, Tucker. 
that'll actually probably be the best thing for him because wherever he goes, he will not call himself Tucker. Also leaving WWE, Callisto. Which one of the shows was he on, Brian? I'm not sure. He was one of the Lucha House Party, I believe. Oh, okay, because I always skip them. Because I didn't understand why the Luchas were having a house party. Um, I'm sure he'll be happier wherever the fuck he ends up. Because wouldn't you have to be? A release has been granted for Bo Dallas. Well, <laughs> how many hostages did we have to trade for him? Before they agreed to grant his release. What did he cost us? Was it a was it a straight ransom in cash, or did we have to give some of our political prisoners over? Uh, has he wrestled there in the past three or four years? I don't remember the last time we saw him do anything on any of the pay-per-views we watched, and I believe I heard that he's now been doing some stuff in real estate in Florida. <laughs> So, so maybe preparing, obviously maybe he's preparing. Yeah. This was unexpected, and he hasn't wrestled in two years. He's got a real estate license, but they, <laughs> they finally did they did they iron chic him and they forget he was under contract. I'm not sure, but Bo Dallas gone possibly now. Who's who's? God damn it! Because they've changed so many of, of these guys' names, but who who was he? In the, he's Bray's brother, right? Correct. And Mike's son. Correct. So maybe they were just being nice to the fiend until they burned him alive. And then, oh, but now Alexa's gone out on her own, got her own puppet party. Oh, Jesus Christ. What? What? what is, so what was Alexa Bliss's <laughs> puppet, by the way? What? Lily. What is it, though? What? It's like a little scary female i don't know how to describe it as a little scary female puppet i mean not scary but supposed to be with like crazy teeth and she oh, talks yeah, i thought it was like an animal because the other one they had, they had the pigs and the cows and the no 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 this appears right. to be uh of the yeah. human form you think they can give some more of bo dallas's family their notice sometime soon so we don't have to look at any of that it would be nice but i don't think that will happen but someone who did get I, his release i like mike rotunda but Someone who did get his release, someone who you were not really a big fan of, Mojo Rawley. That was the idiot that was the sidekick of Ron Gronkowski, right? Rob, but yes, they're best friends in real life. Rob, you said, that's damn right. They were stealing from the WWE. They were robbing <laughs> from them what they were doing. Every time that Mojo Rawley and Ron Gronkowski got paid, they were robbing the company. I'm glad to see him go. I'd like to help him on the way out. And finally, Wesley Blake. I thought he was a 60s sitcom character actor. Who is Wesley Blake? I'm not entirely sure. Maybe that's why some of these... See, that's what I'm saying. Some of these people, the releases are neither shocking nor possibly undeserved. That's why Samoa Joe and, and, and Mickey James, to some extent, stood out in this, in this list. The Bo Dallas thing is interesting, though. If it's true that he's been putzing around in real estate for a while, and I say that jokingly, but maybe he's been successful in real estate. I don't know. It says something about the state of affairs where you leave WWE. If you want to go to AEW and they want you, that's an option. Japan, for some people, is an option. Not for everybody, but some of these guys, there's nowhere else to work. It's about, let's shift into another career now. <sighs> yeah, because the wrestling business has never been in better shape. It's such a boom period. I saw somebody's tweet. <laughs> they said, I can't believe guys like Cornette can't just relax and enjoy this wonderful period of wrestling that we're living in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, anybody else? Did they can anybody else? I believe that is it. All right, anyway, we've got an email here that brought up something. He's on your side, Brian, without without gratuitously putting you over in the email, but you were arguing with me about this last week, and many other people, oh, I can't believe Cornette didn't even like this, the match between Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair. And 
And I'll talk about it here in a minute, but I want to read this. Dear Jim, I'm a longtime fan of yours. I listen to both shows every week. I'm a patron or a patron. I've ordered from Cornette's Collectibles and on and on. I value your opinion in wrestling above all others. But the simple fact of the matter is you are wrong in your assessment of Banks versus Bel Air as the main event of night one of WrestleMania, and the answer to your criticisms went right under your nose. You said that perhaps Angle and Rousey versus Triple H and Stephanie could possibly be the only believable female-included main event. The answer is right there. Ronda Rousey herself main evented multiple major drawing UFC events and nobody questioned it. Actually, Dana White did say for years that he was never going to have women's wrestling in, or women's fighting until he found a box office attraction. But anyway, uh, why? Nobody questioned it because she was over. She was a star. Sasha Banks is over. Bianca Belair is over. They are over in WWE to a comparable degree that Rousey was over in UFC, the top women in the promotion. How much more closely can you draw the comparison? It's a combat sport league. It's not like the NBA versus the WNBA. UFC is a single organization that has both male and female competitors, and it makes no difference to them which gender gets more over. UFC 90, 193, for example, featured Rousey versus Home in the main event, and it set a huge attendance record for the company, drawing 56,214 fans for a gate of 6.8 million, with 1.1 million pay-per-view buys. So it is simply wrong of you to imply on any level that women should never main event WrestleMania. Women can draw just as much as men can, and the audience for combat sports, which pro wrestling claims to be, well, not anymore, but doesn't really care whether they're seeing men or women. They want to see star athletes who they can believe in and get behind competing, and that's what they saw in Banks versus Bel Air. I love being a member of the cult, Jim, but I can't help calling you out when I believe you're wrong, and here is one such occasion. I hope you listen to what I've said and consider modifying your view of this. And without giving you any credit whatsoever, you were saying the same thing. Well, Sasha and, and Bianca are as over as anybody in the company, so shouldn't they be on the main event? <clears throat> and I've got to be honest, although we can argue this both ways here, this email here in a second, I've got to be honest. I was just feeling especially nostalgic for any kind of actual professional wrestling that I could enjoy over that weekend. Even though it was the main event of night one, I was talking about it after I'd seen both of them in quick succession. I didn't knock the match because there wasn't anything wrong with the match. I'm just sitting there going, it's come, and I believe that was the quote I used, it's come to this, that... The girls' match is the most over match. The main event of WrestleMania, traditionally, in history, has been the hottest match, the biggest attraction, the absolute pinnacle of, of uh, professional wrestling, the main event at WrestleMania, and it is now the most over girls, in, or most over people in the company are girls, which to me is, a, is another symbol of how we've completely lost the fucking plot of, of what wrestling is or was for a hundred years. But I will argue one point, Brian, and this was from John, by the way, John in Nashville. Did any, did, did Sasha Banks, Bianca Belair or anybody else draw 56,214 fans? And I know it's a pandemic, but the gate of 6.8 million, 1.1 million pay-per-view buys if they find a girl who can do that kind of business once they let people back in stadiums, if they ever do, et cetera, or that kind of pay-per-view business, well, they can't find that anymore because they don't do pay-per-view. But you see where I'm going with this. We have reached a point in wrestling where it's not that a woman comes along and breaks all the men's box office records and that's and she's such an attraction because of that it's that there really are no box office records anymore and the audience is smaller than ever before and basically we're down to the core audience that just wants to watch this performance and they think the girls perform better than the guys so, but I, I shouldn't have 
sloughed off Bianca Belair and Sasha Banks because they obviously I did say they were better than any of the guys in AEW, and it but it's just I was wrong in not giving them more time and attention, and it was a byproduct of me just realizing that wrestling is never coming back. And this is the state of it today that imagine if for a hundred years, you watched pro basketball, the NBA, they've even been around a hundred years, but you know, wrestling has, and they decided in the last 10 or 15 years, we're going to keep the ball in the hoop and we're going to change everything else about the game. More importantly than that, we're going to let everybody play whether they can or not, and no matter how tall they are, because everybody wants to be included, and it's gender, we're just going to perform some basketball and do some tricks. Would the basketball fans like, even though the trick fans may like it, the Harlem Globetrotters fans may actually know the Globetrotter fans would not even gravitate to that because the Globetrotters were highly trained, probably some of the best legitimate basketball players. That's how they could do all those tricks. <sighs> what? <sighs> it's just that every match that I watch, whether it's male or female, I am reminded that nobody believes anything about this anymore, that not even the participants nor the promoters are taking this seriously. I, the, 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 you know, even though some of the fans now today say, well, it, it does take me out of it when, you know, when they have a big hot match and then the, there's a picture on social media where they're at each other's backyard cookout or whatever the example. And I think Ron Wright and Whitey Caldwell lived in the same town, small town, Kingsport, Tennessee, for 20 years, coexisted. In the same town, people thought they hated each other. They were good friends, but they never let on, and they took it seriously enough that they planned where what houses they bought based on the school districts so that their kids never had to go to school together, and so the other kids wouldn't say they weren't fighting with each other. Or I see these goddamn ridiculous fucking comedy skits and I long for the days when you could get a group of people in an arena to literally live and die with the fucking baby face to the point where if all hope seemed lost, they would risk going to jail to physically assist him. And now the fucking fans are all patting each other on the back for giving star ratings approaching that of what Uncle Dave gave to the latest fucking gymnastics exhibition. I've just, I, I'm, I'm just, I bemoan and I'm heartsick at the lack of any kind of emotion in this business anymore. You want to see, if you watched wrestling, you want to see fucking guys cutting entertaining promos, talking the way that they look like they ought to talk that you can believe in, and when they want to rip some other motherfucker's throat out, you want to believe they want to. And then you go to a match, and you want to see them try to do it. I don't want to see the fans fucking applauding because some goddamn idiot in a dinosaur outfit did a fucking triple fucking Lindy off the top rope onto 17 goofs waiting to catch him. I want to see the fucking heel throw a rope around the baby face's neck and fucking hang him over the top rope and have him so fucking gasping for breath that some fucking asshole that works at a goddamn Jiffy Lube in Shreveport comes over the rail and fucking pulls his goddamn knife out and cuts the motherfucker down. Which has happened, by the way, on a couple of instances. And in, as a matter of fact, it was Tulsa, Nikolai Volkov and Terry Taylor cut the rope to cut Taylor down and slice Nikolai Volkov's boot laces in half with the same fucking swipe. I want to see the fucking fans buying an autographed picture of the baby face and putting it on their wall in their living room next to Jesus and their grandmother. I want mid-sized cities in this country 
to sell two or three hundred thousand wrestling tickets a year, and because of they watch their wrestling show on their goddamn real television station instead of cable to where everybody in town knows who everybody is to where fucking arenas are full and emotions are riding high and goddamn people want to be involved in this fucking chaos. I don't want to sit back and watch a bunch of middle school children play sticky finger with each other. And that's what we're getting these days. And it's a sorry substitute. And so I get a little sour. And I will, I will read you one more thing, Brian, and then you may reply to my fucking meanderings. Um, Rock Rims. We've talked about, every time we talk about his books, I don't know why we do, because every time he, he does a printing, he sells out immediately. So it's not like he needs any promotion. We're probably giving him headaches. Every time we talk about his books, they're out of print. But in his introduction, and he reprinted it in both, Legends and Icons about Southern California wrestling, and then the book about Northern California wrestling as well. But in his introduction, there's a very apt description of what we all used to be able to experience when we went to wrestling matches. Imagine. You're sitting in a movie theater and watching an action movie that engrosses you so much that you begin shouting out loud at the screen, cursing at the villain, and hoping someone will turn the tables on him. And you're not the only one shouting at the villain. Virtually everyone in the theater is also. Now imagine that the villain actually turns towards you as you shout those insults and threats and begins shouting insults back at you, or merely sneers at you before he gives the fallen hero of the movie another kick in the ribs for good measure. Now that you've got your imagination warmed up, picture the villain again turning towards you and sliding his thumb across his own throat as if to say, he's finished, and then spitting on the ground or giving you the finger. While he's doing that, you and everyone else in the theater is urging the hero to get up, pleading with him not to give up, to find that hidden reserve of willpower, strength, and energy so that he can overcome overwhelming odds and defeat the villain. Then you notice an almost imperceptible nod of the hero's head as if he's saying, yes, yes. I can do this. And somehow, some way, the hero rises what, from what seemed like certain defeat and with a never-say-die determination, fueled by the collective encouragement and faith of the audience, he mounts a comeback against the villain whose eyes grow wide with shock that the hero is even able to stand, much less retaliate. More and more, the hero gains ground in the battle and the villain is backpedaling, reeling, and there's a very real look of concern on his face. The energy and the cheers of the theater audience grow both in volume and intensity, and they feel at one with the hero as if their collective energy is making a huge difference in the outcome of the battle. They become so emotionally invested in his character that his defeat would have been their defeat, just as his impending victory would be theirs as well. That's a fucking live wrestling match before they fucked it all up. <clears throat> and we had 18 million fucking corporations and outsiders and people come in and take the thing over and Vince went crazy and thought he was Walt Disney and then all these fucking jacked legs and greenhorns that got into business grew up reading the internet and thinking that they knew everything about wrestling business when as far as if it was fucking brain surgery they wouldn't even be able to find the fucking part of the body the brain's located in because it's a lot deeper than these nitwit performers will ever understand. And the whole thing's been fucked up to where now we're watching fucking Felix and Pac do fucking gymnastics routines with the Cucamonga kids on national television, and they're happy when they get a million fucking people. They're turning cartwheels. What do you think, Brian? I mean, I agree with a lot of your points overall, but I don't see how any of that reflected what you saw with Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair. It was the well, best. No. I thought it was the best match at WrestleMania. I thought it told the best story in the ring. There was real emotion involved, which you'd kill for. You know, when Ric Flair go. cried at the end of Starcade 83, you felt it. Bianca Belair cried at the end of WrestleMania. She won the belt. I thought it was great. And any of the other issues you have with modern wrestling or for, from based on what you were saying, modern wrestling fans, yeah, I kind of think it wasn't 
really, that's what it I'm wasn't saying. exemplified in this match. This match that's was what great. I'm, that's that's if you followed. That's what I'm saying. I I apologized for giving them short shrift because of my general overall dis, discomfort or disgust with just what they're doing for wrestling these days overall. And I took it out on them because it was the last match at WrestleMania, and I was like, "Fucking hell!" And, it was, and it was the best match at WrestleMania. But the other thing is, you, and that's another thing. You have a problem, it seems, with them being women in the main event spot. Because, goddamn, again, and I'm sorry if it's sexist. I don't want to see the lingerie football league. If I was a football fan, I want to see the NFL. I want to see Steve Austin and Bret Hart have a fucking I quit match with juice and fucking passion and emotion and violence. I don't think anybody's well. And I started to say, I don't think anybody's going to get worked up enough to hop the rail and hit the ring on a girl's match, but nobody's going to get worked up enough to hop the rail and hit the ring on a goddamn guy's match anymore either. So I was apologizing. Yeah, no, none of, none of the things that I was talking about were epitomized in the banks and Bel Air matchup except this is where it's come to that we are we have such a small but dedicated modern wrestling audience it's okay oh, they're good performers and well boy what a great story you know let's put them on last and to your earlier point if there were seventy thousand tickets sold and it wasn't a pandemic it would sell out but you can't really give all that credit to any of the matches you know ronda no, rousey no, was it, a it, crossover it, star yes. You know, Suzanne bought her book. Yeah, you know, and she that's, another really thing, that's another thing I was going to say is the UFC crowds, and for some of the pay-per-views and the big events, yes, UFC as a brand, as an audience, but that's the difference between combat sports and, and modern wrestling now is that really the show in wrestling is what draws rather than the main event, whereas the main events in the UFC and in boxing and et cetera are still indicative of the drawing power of the specific individual in the main event it's not just oh it's wrestlemania so we're right. gonna buy it who's on it that's right and, and and that's another problem with wrestling that vince has mostly created um he, he wanted wwf to be the star yeah. not the wrestler and interchangeable names and personalities that we give you and we own your stuff and everything so it's always going to be the brand and not the the star and that's that's completely the antithesis of how wrestling and and any conflict in any sport was ever built to begin with but but i just what have we done what have we done brian what have we done to the wrestling business i take no blame for any of this well i i i try to tell people for 30 fucking years they wouldn't listen to me and now everything i have said has come true the comedification the comedy fine of the business and the exposure of the business and not only just the exposure of is it is it a work or not or is it fake or not, but the actual the explanation of everything has and now here's is is what it is. Then I don't see how it can get any <laughs> that's a famous quote from from Robert Fuller to Jerry Jarrett, or Jerry Jarrett to Robert Fuller, when Jerry said, Robert, it can't get much worse. And Robert said, oh, yes, it can. And then he went back to Knoxville. Um, how can wrestling get any less popular? There's only two million fucking people watching the biggest show. And, and... But yet I'm the one that's crazy because I don't like this stuff when it, it's never been less popular ever in the history of history. And and it's me. Somebody explain that to me. I, I mean, you know, and a lot of people will say, oh, goddamn. So Cornette wants to go back to where, you know, the goddamn heels had to fight their way out of the ring. Yeah, at least we got the feedback. I never thought I'd miss that. Or having to fucking police escorts out of the building or whatever, but then you knew you had people. You had interest. You had them hooked. You had the emotion. And now it's just, uh, you know, oh, let's watch it. It's on Peacock. And I, I just, uh, I never thought 
And anybody that's now you have you've only because you're a young whippersnapper, Brian. You've only known me for 25 years or so. But people who have known me for even longer than that, if you'd have told them 30 years ago, Cornette will not only at some point completely quit the wrestling business, but hate the the sight of it and only watch it because he gets paid to talk bad about it. Uh, they would have been, uh, what the fuck are you talking about? He would, I would have stayed at a wrestling event if I needed emergency surgery or had to go to a family funeral. But I never thought this day would come that I just can't stomach it. Anyway, that's why I'm, I'm cranky all the time. But you know what? I can stop it. Did you have any closing thoughts about that, by the way? I think you covered everything. I once yeah. again will reiterate best match on WrestleMania. <laughs> I'm happy it ended night one. And also, we didn't even point out it was a big moment for a lot of people. Two African American females in the main event, the final match of WrestleMania. It's a pretty historic moment. And they delivered. It was a great match. Very good. And I've. I'm happy for them. I just don't see anybody hitting the ring with a fucking knife over them. <laughs> I, I'll tell you something. There's a better chance of a crazy fan hitting the ring with a knife in a women's match than a men's match nowadays. Well, I don't see what the possibility is of it happening, period, because nobody's mad because they know it's all bullshit. You can't get anybody worked up. If you try to get somebody worked up verbally, they fucking get mad and try to cancel you. <laughs> and if you fucking have a good enough match that you do get people worked up. Then the next match, they start doing goddamn alley oops and, and fucking cheerleading. And you're reminded that it's all fucking bullshit. It's very dark, Brian, very dark. Speaking of which I'm going to be back on vice TV this season, starting May the 6th, a Thursday night, May the 6th. The Dark Side of the Ring Season 3 is going to debut two hours on Brian Pillman. And they've talked to everybody that uh, that was close to Brian and family, and uh, they got Kim Wood. Um, I'm going to be involved in that, so uh, uh, my face will be on television again in a, in a wrestling fashion, but without actually being on a wrestling program. So everybody gets what they want. But uh, do not do not miss me on Dark Side of the Ring because, after all, it's it's becoming a tradition now. Brian, every spring, like the blooming of the dogwoods, to see me on Vice TV. I'm surprised that it's not an annual tradition to see me in the company of the Vice Squad, but <laughs> this is as close as we can get. So Thursday, May 6th, that begins. Um, is there any way to to, to remember... The way wrestling used to be, possibly something that you could you could put in your house and you could have visual remembrance and representation of something that you you really liked and enjoyed that you don't get a chance to see in person anymore. Some, some kind of product, Brian, that you could have easily accessible to you where in your home or wherever you are that could remind you of things that made you happy in the past. What kind of what kind of product would do that? Well, how about our friends over at Skylight Frame? Bingo! That is exactly it. Folks, we've talked about the Skylight Frame. And boy, once again, could the guys in the 80s have had fun with these things. You give a person a Skylight Frame, they set it up in their house, and you can email photographs to it, and they appear on that Skylight Frame in that person's house in seconds. So your mother can see your you know, uh, your favorite uh, moments of your kids, the grandmother or whatever, your family members can stay connected. Or as we've mentioned, candid photography. I th this is, it's big, it's wide open for candid photography. If you want to keep in touch with people that you really care about. But anyway, that's what you do. It sets up in under 60 seconds. It's got a big 10 inch touch screen. It holds multiple photographs you can swipe through them with your finger you can you can tap it you can tap it with your finger and thank the person who sent you that particular picture so you can give them the finger right there it, i mean and multiple people can contribute photos to this so if you know the whole the whole dang family can join in anyway and as a special offer 
You can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to Skylight Frame. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T, skylightframe.com, and enter the code DRIVE. $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame. Just go to skylightframe.com and enter code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E. Um, obviously, they sponsor both our programs, and we only got one code, folks, so I'm not crazy. That's right. Not about this. And that's well, No, you're, well, you're right. I'm not crazy. About right? this. But, but also about this. But wait a minute. Which one did you? I'm right about both. I'm right about this, and I'm not crazy. You're not crazy about this. You are correct. Oh, God damn it. Speaking of crazy, please explain to me what is going on with Lacey Von Eric. Well, there's something you don't hear on a wrestling podcast too often. No, yeah, I hadn't. And I don't know this young lady. She was in TNA after I was gone. I believe I have said hello at a wrestling fan fest a few years back, but I don't know this young lady and didn't know that she was doing anything with wrestling. But you, Brian Last, got such a, a, a tickle and a chuckle out of some of the stuff that has been on. Was it on her Twitter or she's got a video stream, a blog, a show that she does, whatever. She put it out on the internet, video of herself at WrestleCon. And not like appearing at WrestleCon, but going around WrestleCon and talking to all the other people at WrestleCon. And you sent me the the link to these videos, and that's why I asked the question, and I will reiterate it. What the fuck's going on with Lacey Von Eric? I have no idea. I have no idea. It was the first thing I had really heard about her. A friend of mine had mentioned recently a promotion in Texas, and I had Googled it, and I saw that she was involved with it. And that was the first I had heard of her in years. And I said, you know, oh, that makes some sense. You know, Dallas, Texas, Von Eric. You get a Von Eric somehow. There you go. Makes some sense. But then I saw these clips of her. I don't know if she was day drinking or just enjoying life, but going and walking around WrestleCon and just interacting with various wrestlers. we're, we're We're not making accusations just out of our ass because in every video she had a beer can in her hand. So it's not like we're throwing casting aspersions on whether uh, the question of whether or not she was drinking. The question is whether or not that she's lost her rabbit ass mind. Because for one thing, she didn't know who it she went up to Kevin Nash, and Nash is wearing an NWO shirt, and she said, Oh, do you wrestle for them? And he looked up at her like <laughs> And Nash, under the best of circumstances at a fan event, is probably not going to be just a barrel of laughs. But he looked at her like she had turds hanging out of her mouth. So I don't wrestle at all. She thought that NWO (laughs) was MLW because she said, I think my my cousins wrestle for them. Uh, Then she goes up to Ricky Steamboat, who's in front of a poster saying, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. She doesn't know who Ricky Steamboat is. Oh, the dragon. And, and she asked him if it, if that was like a Cleveland steamer. And of course, he, Ricky is the <laughs> Ricky is just the nicest guy and just the kindest, most reserved, professional. I mean, whatever, you know, but just he says, no, I I I don't. Oh, that's when you so you take a dump on somebody's chest. He just he stares at her like she's taking a dump on his chest just now. <laughs> and then what? Oh, god damn it! What else? He she said something else that oh, that's what it, it, she said. Do you have any good Von Eric stories? Well, Ricky Steamboat, I don't know when he would have ever worked with one of the Von Erichs or on the same show with one of the Von Erichs. He never worked Dallas. They in 91. Carolinas. 91 in, WWF, he would have worked with Kerry. He would have worked with Kerry. Well, there's his daughter, and I don't even, she wasn't even identifying herself. I don't know if a lot of the guys even knew who she was, but so he's he's like thinking for a minute of uh, Von Erich's story, and and she's like, oh, oh God damn, how did she work into it? Where she said, uh, but she said, oh, you, you didn't work with it. Maybe, were you just in Japan? Did you just wrestle in Japan, Ricky Steamboat? He's like, no. 
That's the problem. She does not know who any of these people are. She didn't grow up around the business. She, she was like, what, two when Carrie died? And the mother was not around the business. And she's obviously not, I hate to say this, a particularly intelligent person to begin with, or elsewise that it, you would have been able to tell on the videos. But was she, because her running joke, what, do you have one of those things, one of the videos that she put out on her Lacey TV or whatever? It was all over Twitter. I have one here right now. Does this have her running joke on it with the punchline that she I believe did it like does. half of the videos with? The video on Twitter, the person's name was I Am Hollywood. They went through apparently this entire Lacey Von Eric web stream and just clipped the important moments. This one is labeled... Lacey meeting a random WWE employee. Just, I hate to play spoiler here, but to reveal it, this is Lacey just randomly going up to Ted DiBiase. Yeah. Here's this. Where's my rookie? Oh, she went laid down. Huh? <laughs> Hi. Hey. He has a WWE shirt on. My family helped you with that company. And what do you think about that? I think that's wonderful. Yeah, but then they all died. So great job, WWE. And there it is. And oh, DiBiase looks at her like, what the hell did she just say? I don't know if Ted even knows who she is. No, because... It, but I, I don't know. Maybe she's not close with Kevin or his side of the family or whatever, but... I was surprised when she got in wrestling because I would have thought that somebody in the family would have said, especially no, because you are, you're a woman on top of everything. And, and I, I'm sure the way she looks, a number of the guys have probably taken advantage of uh, her lack of what's the word I'm searching for common sense, if nothing else. Uh, but I can't believe that somebody hasn't said, maybe the, you should not be around doing this. And well, here, Here's one. Let me play you this one real quick. Oh it's only boy. 11 seconds. Apparently she went up to Jake the Snake Roberts. <laughs> here's this. Jake! You're on Lacey V TV Live! Wow. This is Jake Roberts. I have so much memories with you. Remember at Motel 6? I think your snake got out. <laughs> that wouldn't be the first time Jake Snake got out of the Motel 6. I, uh... So she knew who Jake was. Most people, it'd be the other way around. They'd know who everybody else was, wouldn't want to admit they knew who Jake was. <sighs> and I don't know. Apparently, WrestleCon didn't draw to. Oh, she went up to. Because <laughs> a lot of the videos were about how joking about how nobody was there. Imagine that. It's a fucking pandemic. But she went up to Selena De La Renta and didn't know who she was. And apparently they've actually worked together. <laughs> Which Selena reminded her of. And I wish, and, and the thing is, when she's shooting all these videos, she keeps the camera on her. I wish she'd have put the camera on Selena De La Renta a little bit more in that clip. But. And, and a lot of people then might say, well, Cornette, you, you didn't mind when Marshall and Ross Von Erich got in the business. And, you know, here's the difference in, in those guys. And I watched the other night the last of the Von Erichs again, um, the Dark Side episode. <sighs> Marshall and Ross, I worked with at MLW a couple years ago. And I had met them a couple times before, a show in Oklahoma a few years ago. And you can't find two nicer, you know, just better guys. No bad habits, respectful. They're great athletes. That's genetic. That runs in a family. Um, and I think the difference is in them and their dad's, you know, generation of the family they didn't have the pressure. They didn't have to grow up on television in Dallas, Texas as rock stars. They weren't 
put in a position where in their early 20s in a fucking booming city that they were TV stars and Texas heroes and people would give them everything and do everything and whatever the case. And they, the generation after, they just were raised by their dad as, you know, as more just private citizens. And they they obviously wanted to follow in his footsteps. But I think one of the things that may have saved them from developing any bad habits from wrestling or whatever is that they were not only a little bit older when they got involved, they're older now. I'm not saying they're ancient, but they're, I think, early 30s or 30-ish now, depending on which one's the oldest one. They're more mature. They had have been out of, grew up more out of the spotlight. And then the one thing that has been a problem that has held them back in wrestling is that they've lived in Hawaii, which, you know, great, it's paradise and doesn't everybody wish we could, but that's kept them from getting experience because there's no wrestling in Hawaii. They can train with their dad, you know, but you can't do it in front of people. They've had tours and they, with the modern business, there's no territory. So they get booked for shots. Um, so from the time they started wrestling till now, years wise, they've got experience, but they haven't had as much repetition as even the modern independents that work in all these mud shows every weekend. And, and maybe that's one of the reasons why they're wonderful kids and don't have any personal problems because they haven't been around these fucking mud show knuckleheads on a regular basis. But the, the point is, like I said, the only drawback to Marshall and Ross is just they have not had the opportunity to get experience work as regularly, but they're wonderful kids. And, you know, I I have to think that maybe comes from having Kevin in their life and, you know, and, and learning from example rather than this poor girl grew up just knowing that her father, she was told, was a famous wrestler. and has no idea of this world whatsoever, and it shows. And uh, maybe she ought not, uh, maybe she ought to find a hobby, collect stamps. What do you think? Or keep doing these videos. Or because <laughs> you, see now, you're, you're a heartless, cruel person that wants your entertainment at the expense of other people. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Cleveland Steamer. <laughs> Steamboat. God, damn, Steamboat, Steamboat says, Boat. what's that? <laughs> That's it. Like, yeah, he's like, because like, I mean, a good portion of the boys probably would have known, but not Ricky Steamboat. <laughs> and then she's joking about her dead family. And you could, you could see almost his butthole quivering, sitting in the chair at this line of questioning. Anyway, real quickly. Before we go any further, I have another update on stuff that we've talked about here on the program. Remember a week or two ago, I said, well, now they've ruined Kung Fu, the TV show. Yes, you They've did. remade it, and it's no longer Kwai Chang Kane in the Old West. It's now some college girl from San Francisco fighting crime. Um, ben, I mentioned the, you know, a, a little background on Kung Fu, the TV show. Well, Chester Snapdragon McFisticuffs who has been following me, and I've called the police several times, but he's been following me for a long time, has Chester Snapdragon McFisticuffs. He wanted to clarify some of these things. Hey, Jim, I'm an avid Bruce Lee fan, and I wanted to give you some clarification regarding the details you provided about the Kung Fu TV series from the 70s. Bruce Lee's wife, now Linda Lee Cadwell, claims that it was Bruce who conceived of the show and that Warner Brothers stole the concept from him. And I've heard this story. She made this claim in her memoir slash Bruce biography, The Man Only I Knew. She claims that before Lee worked on the ABC TV show Longstreet, which debuted in September 1971, he had been working on a concept involving a Shaolin priest and master of kung fu roaming America and getting involved in various exploits. She alleges that Warner Brothers, realizing that the concept of martial arts was really taking hold in the American consciousness, decided to do a television series with it as a focal point and ultimately contacted Bruce as a means to that end. He pitched them on the concept and provided them many ideas that she alleges made it into the show that aired starring David Carradine. 
Further evidence of this is found when Bruce casually brings the show concept up in a December 1971 interview with Pierre Burton. In that interview, Burton mentions that Bruce might be starring in a show then to be called The Warrior that would feature him doing martial arts in a Western setting. Lee confirms this, saying that was the original concept he pitched, but that Warner Brothers and Paramount were wanting to give the show a more modern setting due to concerns that Westerns were out. Bruce, however, felt the show should be set in the Wild West because he felt it gave it more justification for the violence. Anyway, in that same interview, Lee also acknowledge, acknowledges the difficulties he was facing with the notion of him as a lead character in an American series, uh, saying he understood the dilemma of Warner Brothers and Paramount were in. If it was taking place in Hong Kong with an American lead, he'd have the same concerns. Because that's where I mentioned, and some people took this out of context too, I said you were going to have a problem with people believing in the early 70s, a guy the size of Bruce Lee in the Old West beating up all the cowboys. Not because he couldn't really beat up all the cowboys, because it didn't look right visually from what people were used to. Uh, but anyway, um, another biographer contradicts this, asserts the show was not invented by Bruce Lee, but stemmed from a movie treatment in 1969, blah, blah, blah. Uh, point is, what does not appear to be in doubt, however, is that Lee was in consideration for the role and that he auditioned for it, but was passed over for, among other things, concerns his accent was too strong, that his personality was too intense to portray a serene character, that may be true for being too authentic, and a reluctance to go with a Chinese lead. So anyway, that's the update. Uh, and that it's the same thing as in wrestling. It's not whether you can actually beat up the Cowboys. It's whether you look like a person that can beat up the Cowboys to a large amount of people. Does that make any sense, Brian? It does, of course. And that's what we, you know, when you've, because I see now the, the people are saying, and we'll get to the, we'll get to all friends wrestling in a second, but I see people go, well, now the, the Bucks are full-fledged heels and they can really show what they can do. Yeah, they're two middle school kids imitating wrestling moves done by people you actually used to believe in. It's You're visually still seeing two kids that, and it's not even a Bruce Lee 5'6", 140-pound guy. It's a fucking soft, fishy white, flabby fucking five foot six hundred and forty pound guy from Cucamonga. And it's just ridiculous. Anyway, you know what I'd like to do, Brian Last? What's that? I'd I'd like to have a painting or a portrait or something made of the perfect wrestler. Maybe that classic magazine cover of Nature Boy Buddy Rogers wearing the world championship belt to show people what a perfect wrestler should look like. They could just look right up at my wall and see that painting. I wonder where I could get that done. Well, I think I know where you're headed. You can get that done with Paint Your Life. Why in the world didn't I think about that? Of course, one of our fine, fine sponsors, PaintYourLife.com, could take that, that classic magazine cover or any other photograph or combination of photographs and in no time at all, turn it into a hand-painted portrait done by a world-class artist. And we've talked about this, folks, whether you want to get different generations of the same family all in one place at the same time when they never were before, whether you want to put yourself in a special place that you long to be, whether you want to remember a cherished pet, whether you want to know what your kids look like when they grow up and move out and don't visit you anymore, and you don't want to invite those kids because then they'll come and bring their kids and the whole house will be full with a bunch of natter and nincompoops. You can just have a painting of them and it doesn't make any noise. Whatever you want. Perfect birthday, anniversary, wedding gift, something that can be cherished forever. Go to paintyourlife.com. You can see all this stuff. And, and if you want 20% off and free shipping of this incredible hand-painted portrait, done by a world-class artist of your loved ones or treasured places. You can get 20% off and free shipping by texting the word DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, 
to 64,000. That's D R I V E to 64000. One more time, texting drive to 64000. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. Well, I've had just a week filled with sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, and waterfalls. What are you doing over there on your other programs? Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. The latest episode of Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam up right now, where John and his guest look and review a Wrestling World Top 50 from the spring of 1981. How can someone pick apart a Top 50 list for one hour? Find out on Stick Find to out. Wrestling. I could, pick a, I could pick apart a Top 5 list for an hour. Find out why Gene Kaniski, who was semi-retired, was ranked number 43. And much, much more at mcadampod.com available wherever you find your favorite podcast was that when he went back and made some shots in st louis in 81 didn't he make a late shot in st louis he may have but that wasn't why it can't be why we'll have to find out by listening we'll have to find out by listening at mcadampod.com or stick to wrestling with john mcadam wherever you find your favorite podcast of course Pro Wrestling Spotlight, then and now with John Arezzi, where we review the classic episodes of Pro Wrestling Spotlight from 30 years ago. This week, because John has been so busy, he's on the road doing interviews left and right, doing TV, talking about his new book, Matt Memories. We do a very special best of some of the funniest moments, some of the most memorable moments of the early days of the show, including the still stunning interview with Jack the Giant Stalker. Plus, Mark Tendler and Black Venus in studio, the debut of Joey, the Dean of Wrestling, plus the Power Twins fighting with people, Cactus Jack, Paul Heyman, and so much more at pwspod.com or search for John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> Listen to opening day Star Wars and extra innings today and go through the archives at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mothership. Yeah, I couldn't take it this week. All right, should we talk about the big event of the week now that the Wednesday Night War is over? All the All Friends Wrestling fans got what they wanted and they're unopposed. And they did their second biggest number ever. Next to only their, their debut show, right? I think so. Because their debut show was 1.4 million. This is 1.2 million. That means that somewhere around 450 or 500,000 of the six or 700,000 usual NXT customers decided to bop over and sample their restaurant at AEW. Uh, in addition to the usual 750-ish or so that have already been eating there. So they're starting over. Just like starting over, starting over. Now, it only took them, what did it take them? I can't even remember now. I, I don't have the graph here in front of me. We talked about the, the viewership uh, several weeks ago. But it took them, what, about several months to to cut their uh, or initial audience in half from 1.4 million to 700,000. How long do you think it's going to take them to cut this one in half? Do you think they'll go up from here or down, Brian? They always could go up, but I believe it would go down from here. They, they're not a collector's plate. <laughs> <laughs> it could go up, but they mostly go down. They're starting over again. They have no show on opposite them. Several of the uh, several, a number of the people who have apparently been watching NXT decided, okay, we're going to watch this show. But now, how many of those people liked it? Or how many of those people were the ones that were watching NXT because that was the closest thing they can find to what they remember wrestling used to be? 
we shall find out. I have a feeling. And and also, this was $1.2 million with Mike Tyson advertised as an enforcer and unopposed. Uh, they got, a, what, a little over a million out of Shaq. So, I mean, I hate to predict the future, and some plates could go down or whatever, but I, I think they're back below a million uh, within the next couple of weeks, and then they'll settle somewhere around that until they either somehow become a lot better or somehow get even worse. Can you say I'm wrong? I don't know. You know, I hate to get into the prediction game with the ratings. I do think they'll come down. I wonder how many people tuned into NXT not realizing NXT wasn't there and then turned on AEW. How many of those people are the NXT audience that now we're going to watch their show on Tuesday and this on Wednesday? I personally think it probably will go down. Probably not a big jump down, but slightly. I can't imagine it going too much further up based off this episode, which was a taped episode. But time will tell. But they nobody knows. That's a, it, it, I think we're past the point, and actually even back in the Attitude Era, uh, the ratings would usually bear up that live or tape had no bearing if they didn't know it was taped. So, you know, I don't think that, I think that they, you know, obviously Tyson meant uh, quite a bit. And, you know, you got to say it for him. He loves the wrestling business. Um, uh, he would have made a lot more money if he'd, have, if he'd have gone whole hog into this about 15 or 20 years ago. But who knows what his personal financial situation is. Anyway. I'll try not to be full of my wrestling malaise when I talk about this program. I'm still going to talk about the program because that's what, honestly, people who are in the same boat as I am look forward to these days. I take the hit so they don't have to because we're so disgusted at what passes for wrestling these days. We at least want to have something to piss on. This wasn't a rotten, it wasn't, it wasn't a rotten show for them. I can say that. Uh, I still don't understand a lot of this, but it wasn't rotten, and they actually had a few uh, highlights, shall we say. The the Bucks cold open, though, right off the bat. Why? Why did they do this? Why did they turn heel just like they did six weeks ago and then again three months ago or whatever? But this time they mean it because they chose friendship. And this is... This is where the disconnect is between people who who watch this and accept these guys and people like myself who just can't do it. Old Pie Face did a decent promo. He speaks well. He's got the the you know the tough guy face that he puts on and everything. But look at them. They're children. This is cosplay. They, you can't take this seriously. The, these guys suddenly are now, though they're the most fearsome team since the Road Warriors. Whatever, the newer, better version of themselves. It, too bad we didn't get the older, crummier version. Um, I mean, any comments on that promo to open the, the event to explain their dastardly deeds of last week? No, I'm not a fan of Matt Jackson on the mic or emoting, so I don't have any other comments. And then, then they go to Mike Tyson, and he's cutting a promo, but I, <laughs> they've actually got Tyson cheerful. He said, I'm delighted. I'm delighted to be here. Why is Mike Tyson happy? Iron Mike, badass Mike Tyson, Austin and Tyson, Austin and Tyson. And now he's out there in a white t-shirt and pink cargo shorts, and he's delighted to be there. And MJF comes in, and he does a great promo, of course, and he is two inches taller and looked bigger in the shoulders than Mike Tyson. And, of course, he asked Tyson to be on the right side of history and et cetera by giving him the backhanded, you know, fucking knocks and knocked his face tattoo and then gave him a blank check, which... Tyson then ate. He must have been listening to the <laughs> drive-through this past 
Monday when I ate the notes on WrestleMania. Uh, this was better than it should have been, especially when you've got the baddest man on the planet coming coming out there using the word he's delighted to be there. But it was a good interchange between the two of them. And that's all we got for the next 30 minutes besides the opening match. For the tag team title, Felix and Pac against the Cucamonga Kids. <sighs> Explain to me why when you have two guys that have just turned heel and this time apparently they really mean it you have them in their first television match after turning heel take on a quote unquote baby faced team called the death triangle where one guy's nicknamed bastard and the other guy has a heel brother with a heel translator haven't the death triangle been heels lately help me with this i don't know for sure that they are depends on who they're wrestling against what about the heel fucking translator he wasn't there this week well he was there the, oh, God damn. he was there two weeks ago when they were heels he was, he was there two weeks ago and three weeks ago and four weeks ago being a heel interpreting for these fucking guys The Cucamonga Kids cut came out in brand new versions of Bill Dundee's old 80s Elvis jumpsuits from Memphis. But in this match, there was no jump start. They started it with a lockup. So there's points there. It's like they were actually trying. And I'll be honest with you, especially because they were going 30 fucking minutes. This thing went 30 fucking minutes. They couldn't start out at 100 miles an hour. They actually had to start working. And, you know, the thing is, the Bucks can do the moves. It's just preposterous seeing it. But they can cosplay as all these different style of wrestlers. So, you know, I wouldn't have a problem if they had jobs as like the motion capture guys for the video games where they imitate all the moves but when you're trying to take them seriously as the world tag team champions um and and pack i'm now i'm seeing pack standing next to matt jackson they're the same height pack looks so good you can only tell he's that small when he's standing next to the bucks who you know are small and they introduced Pac and Felix at 389 pounds. Even though Felix doesn't, he's got the bodysuit to cover it up, and you could get away with 215 or 220 for Pac because of the way he looks. But they just diminish their size even when they don't have to. And they they had a decent pace at first and did some wrestling, and then Felix and Baldo, you know, got in and broke into the gymnastics, and then they all started jumping and diving and flying and flinging themselves everywhere and gesticulating about. Um, did you see the exchange that Pac and Felix went through where they kept handing each other Pie Face's leg and, and the other one would grab the leg and the first one would kick him and then the... They'd spin the guy's leg around so the other one grabbed the leg and the other one would kick him and then they synchronized double team kicked him in the shins. I What the fuck? Would, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Did I describe it anywhere near accurately? That's kind of the best way to describe it, I think. Okay. Um, the Bucks were working his heels because in between doing the same cheerleading alley-oops that they do in every match, they would stop and then they would do something that a heel would do and they'd make a heel face. So as I mean, they are able to cosplay all these different types of wrestler. Um, they got some heat on Felix and then Pac got a tag and made a nice comeback and then forgot himself and started working like a heel and started getting heat on pie face and just being out and out heelish. And then the bucks both stopped pack and gave him a double power bomb. No, gave both of them a double power bomb. They stopped pack and they got Felix and pack out on the floor and gave him a double power bomb. Both of them at the same time onto the apron of the ring and didn't go for a cover on either one of them. That's when they just walk around and do their heel stuff and cosplay as their heel 
fucking style. Um, it's kind of like wrestling karaoke. It's not the real artist, but it's somebody singing their song. And every once in a while, they they hit the right note. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't know. They Pie Face did a clown spot, begging for his opponent. He got out on the the baby face's corner and acted like he was trying to beg his opponent to tag him, and then he acted like he was crying. And then Nick and Felix at one point got simultaneous cold tags because nobody was trying to stop either one of them. Uh, Felix and Nick did some more Western swing dancing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pac and Felix did some really ridiculous shit to, to Baldi, Baldo there and couldn't beat him. And it would not end for any reason whatsoever this kept going on and on and then at one point pack waist locks one of the kookamonga kids and is going to german suplex him but he's holding on to the, the the buck is holding on to the ropes so felix jumps up to the top rope walks the top rope like a tight rope kicked at the buck but missed him, but he let go anyway, and then Felix jumped into the ring and immediately dove out the other side onto Pie Face and almost killed both of them. It just lots of super kicks, a Canadian destroyer where the fucking guy bounced to his feet. Nobody is covering anybody after these things. They're just sprinting into the next exhibition. They did a ludicrous four-way on the floor where they both gave both these guys reverse hurricane ranas with the injury level that they've already got there. They're doing the still do the reverse hurricane ranas and do them on the floor. It's a rotten bump. It looks like shit. It's dangerous. And any all anybody would have to do is just put up a sign right before the gorilla position. No reverse hurricane ranas. And then if somebody does one, fine them a hundred or two. Maybe depending on how he pays these guys, five hundred or a thousand, they'll get the fucking point. I had no problem with it. I very seldom had to find people in OVW when we said know this or know that or know the other thing, because we said know this or know that or know the other thing. No pile drivers, they're illegal. No blood, it's against state law. No cussing on the microphone, whatever the fuck. But nobody's telling anybody anything here um anyway how did this thing oh it's still going continued <laughs> next page pie face kicked out of a superplex and a splash off the top rope from two different guys superplex splash off top he kicks out then they give him another splash his brother makes a save more tags in and out because after all that's what really makes a tag team match great is after you've got the heat on the baby face, he's made a comeback. You want to tag in and out 16 more times. Uh, and then finally, they took Felix's mask off and then double super kicked him in the face, but you could tell they didn't hit him in the face because he's holding his hands over his fucking face, covering up his unmasked face. And anyway, and then they pinned him with that. One, two, three. Nothing else worked. The bazooka, the machine gun, but taking his mask off and Two super kicks they beat nobody else with. And Felix is bald too. Why is it, why are all the mask guys bald too? I don't know. Mr. Well, Wrestling Ray 2 was bald. Well, that was natural. He wasn't all the time, but Rey Mysterio bald. When he, t he took his mask off, he was bald. Anyway, 30 fucking minutes. But I will give them this. It was the first match I've ever seen. For either one of these teams, they didn't have a jump start or an afterbirth. But after 30 minutes, good God, how would you have time? What would you think about this thing? I really liked it. Hmm? I did a little experiment on this night. Okay. And I didn't know going into it that the Young Bucks were going to be on for the first 30 minutes. That was a surprise. But this is the Garden State, and marijuana is now legal here. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to smoke the biggest fucking joint I can before I watch AEW. <sighs> so I went into this match high as a kite. And I kind of liked it. I enjoyed a lot of the stuff. I will say 
a couple of epiphanies. One, I wrote a little poem. What? A, a poem? Referee. He counts. He pleads. He puts his hands on his head. That's everything the referee does there. He counts when they go to the floor. Watch him. He gets to like three or four and he's like, what am I going to do? And then he just starts like, please come back in, please. Pleading. And then he puts his hands on his head. It's just go to over and over. But it hit me the difference in the Bucks. And I don't agree with the Bobby Eaton comparison for Nick Jackson. Oh, but you I, better not. But I understood why it has been made better watching it here. Matt Jackson is badly trying to act like a heel. Now, in real life, he may be a total douchebag. He may be a heel. But he's not being the real life Matt Jackson. He's acting it up. The facial expressions, the over emoting, the bad acting. Not even going to get into the fact that he kicks out of everyone's finisher. It's like yeah. Scott Hall on steroids. Well, and he and the he opposite gives, actually. He gives two human beings Northern Lights suplexes at the same time. It's ridiculous. With that said, Nick Jackson, who doesn't really have any moments of bad acting. As a heel who just runs in there and does a bunch of shit that looks really good and you want to hit him and it's natural, he's worlds better than his brother. Well, you you may have hit on something here because the one th the one constant thing is he doesn't change personality because he doesn't really have a personality. He's just the guy that stands there while Pie Face cuts the promo has the same blank look on his face and just goes out and does a wide variety of, of, of Cirque du Soleil moves. But it fits no matter whether he's a baby face or a heel because he has to change nothing because he's not doing anything. Is that what you're saying? Kind of. I mean, I just thought that he actually, seeing him as a heel finally, I think they've been heels forever, but being firmly presented as heels... You realize, I can understand why this guy would get some heat as a heel. He looks like shit. He's really smooth at hitting everything he does. And you'd want to see someone kick their ass if he was in there with someone that you actually liked. Yeah. yeah. Now, look, it would be maybe a different philosophy now that they're heels if they didn't do everything they did as baby faces. You know, when Mick Foley turned heel in ECW, his way of turning heel was to start doing headlocks and hold the guy down. Everyone wanted him to go through a table. No, I'm a heel. Now I'm going to show you. Another side of things. But with that said, and all the usual AEW shenanigans, and this match was the best and worst of AEW. There were some great sequences, some really spectacular high spots. I could deal with that. I can't deal with when they get to the point of the match, and maybe it was 20, 25 minutes in, whatever it was, where specifically Matt Jackson kicking out of everything because there were several everything. several finishes i'm like oh that's the finish no and then it's like but how could he kick out of that in what world would he kick out of that and with ray phoenix getting pinned i saw it as in lucha libre the worst thing you could do is take someone's mask off without winning it he was covering his face no matter what they did he was gonna just get pinned there because well yes he i can't and wrestle I, any further i get that i get that point but and I think excrement tried to get that point across. But it, now the super kicks work. If it couldn't, they, if he's if you're gonna tell that story, couldn't they have just ripped his mask off and him fucking put his hands over his face and then them schoolboy him because he's not gonna try to kick out because the mask is more important. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, but they got to get the super kick in. Have to. Um. Adam Page, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Remember when this guy was going to be the next big babyface star and the, one of the guys to carry AEW into the future and the champion and blah, 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 and now he's doing bad comedy backstage with the dork order. And nobody can possibly care if any of these people catch on fire and spontaneous combustion or not, can they? At this point? They have some fans, but I think this is kind of the uh, oddities portion of Monday Night Raw. Speaking of oddities, Officer Bar Brady was up next uh, interviewing the Inner Circle and Mike Tyson because Chris Jericho, now another of the things that he did after he got his fucking ass kicked, was he he went around calling everybody he'd wronged and started apologizing <laughs> to him. And one of the people he called was Mike Tyson. 
Do you have a message on your voicemail? I don't have one. He must not have got, uh, maybe he wanted to talk to me in person and I never answer the phone. Ah. That's what it is. Um, I mean, this was a classic baby face promo though. I mean, a classic from the seventies where he was the, uh, doing the baby face. I've been wrong and I have to redeem myself and I've got to apologize for this. And the way he was speaking in the whole nine yards, I expected him you know, to fucking come out with the, the whole goddamn, uh, you know, seventies baby face fucking, uh, I've, I've got to apologize to everyone and I'll spend the rest of my life trying to live up to the, you know, your faith in me It blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was good. It was a good baby face promo, old time baby face promo, but I figured out Mike Tyson does not need to speak more than a few words. Because the longer he goes, the more you realize that he's not accustomed to public speaking is the nicest way I can say it. He, it, If he stands there and glares at you with that fucking horrible face tattoo, okay, that's Mike Tyson. But when he talks with the voice and he starts fumble fucking his words a little bit, he becomes a regular human being. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't have much of a problem with it now because he is in his 50s. It's not like he's the baddest guy on the planet anymore. Well, but that's what they're selling. That's what they bought. People's perception of him, not what he really is. That's the point. You don't let people... If you if you buy someone for the public's perception of him, then you don't expose him in a way other than would bolster and you know, support that perception, right? Yeah. So if Mike Tyson just says, don't get in my way, you're going down or whatever, that would have contributed as much to this as him going back and forth, talking, etc., eating MJF's check. That was Mike Tyson saying earlier in the promo, I'm delighted to be here. That's not Mike Tyson. That's Michael fucking Jackson. Maybe that's why he has some financial problems. He's chewing checks. <laughs> it's not how we do it, Mike. And and they'll never know that MJF wrote it with disappearing ink. But anyway, um, I know what your favorite part of the program was. It was up next. Red Velvet versus Jane Cargill, one-on-one. -on -one. They drop every other angle and program they have ever started since the first week this program went on the air, but this will go on forever. I think I think you have have influenced them with your your uh, support of this program. I can only hope. I really like Red Velvet. You know, we all talk about Jade because she's such a cartoon character, but I actually really like Red Velvet. I think Red Velvet's pretty good, and she keeps getting destroyed by Jade each yeah, time we yeah. see her. But Red Velvet, I think, shows a lot in there. She actually, she's got oomph. She looks good. She's uh, on the small side, aren't they all? Uh, except for Jane. But uh, she works hard. And I mean, that standing back moonsault that she misses a lot, I could do without that. But she works hard and she's not afraid to break her fucking fingernails. And she actually hit that move for once. And when I was she was setting say, it I up here, it. Yeah. when she was setting it up, I was like, oh, no, please don't. Yeah. You keep missing this. And she hit it. And this, you know, here's the, obviously, they're working out a lot of this match. It was it was more apparent in the first match that Jade had on TV uh, that they had worked it out. Was that, wait a minute, was that with Red Velvet or was that with somebody else? The tag team match? No, the, fir the, the last singles match we saw from Miss Cargill. Oh, I don't think it was Red Velvet, but I don't it remember was, who it was. But anyway, they had a match that you could tell they'd worked out in the in the gym, and nothing wrong with that because they're green. This one they'd worked it out, but there was they were they never got out of control. They 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 may have stumbled a couple of times because they were throwing some things and they were hitting each other, but they kept the pace up and they worked hard. It was worked out, but they they didn't get out of control and they they did a good job. And when they went to the break, I said, "Oh, they're pushing their luck." Um, but on the other side of it, I wrote Red Velvet may be the best girl they got on the roster besides Serena and Thunder Rosa, just because of their experience level. Then she actually hit the standing moonsault, but missed the big moonsault and Jane hit her finish. 
which what the what did they call it? Jaded. That that uh, <laughs> I, I, I missed that. I missed. I, that. I think they they call it jaded. That may need some work, but it it was not a bad match. Um, which, I mean, you can still tell that she, she just poses constantly, and she's always posing. Even when she's walking, she's posing, and she's just not comfortable yet. But you know, doing what she's doing. But you know, she she'll get there eventually. See, I'm trying to say something good about somebody. Yeah, I like that. I just, I just want to hear her talk on live TV because that is a train wreck guaranteed every time. Notice they've kept her off a live mic ever since a then. Exactly, and that's why I wish they would let her do that some more because that was magical. Um, Closing thoughts on uh, Velvet and Jane? I kind of summed it all up. Really liked it. Thought it was good. I think Red Velvet is really talented. They obviously have a lot invested in Jade. They think she'll be something, but I like Red Velvet. I went into a White Castle over on Westport Road about 2 o'clock in the morning here in Louisville about 40 fucking three years ago, and one of the girls working behind the counter was had the name tag on was Velvet. And that was an unusual name at the, even at the time back then. I said, your name is Velvet? And she said, yes. I said, have you ever been felt? <laughs> She didn't find the humor in that. I can see why. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the next match I didn't find any humor in. Is this the first time that you can ever remember that they tried to get a boxer over with a knockout gut punch? I can't remember a finish of the match being like this one. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, Anthony Agogo. And God damn it, that needs to be a strip club somewhere. Uh, but Anthony Agogo with QT Marshall, etc., took on infamous join him in the ring Cole Carter. They said Anthony boxed at 167 and now he weighs 231. Let's just come out and bury a motherfucker, why don't we? Um, and now and they're saying, well, Cornette wants everybody to exaggerate. No, I don't want you to tell me that the guy that's standing in front of me weighs 230 pounds weighed fucking 65 pounds less a few years ago. Because then I'm going to know something's up. Because he's still in good shape. It's not like he ate the whole goddamn Denny's. Um, so the, this was the, the guy who was a, a boxer, a, apparently a medalist. But within the first minute, he just hit one gut shot, and the guy went down, and the referee stopped it. And it was it was a working looking gut shot. And he may have been stiff with it. I don't know about that. I wasn't on the other side of it. But the guy took a regular old fucking exaggerated bump. Did he not? Was that what I was looking at? Yeah, he just bent over and started selling his gut on the mat, and the referee called it. It if this guy can work at all. I know what they're going for. They're going for the boxer. He'd knock him out, and it could be real, and it could happen. Well, let him show that he could wrestle for a minute and then hit a motherfucker on a chin and knock him out because that's what people are still a accepting of as a knockout. It didn't do this guy any favors to just have a, a, a job guy that if we've ever seen him before, nobody remembers him. Lock up with a guy, do a fucking go behind, and then he punches the guy in the gut, and the referee stops it. This was pretty bland for a guy that they can make something out of. I don't know what did you did you think Anthony should have gone go go a little little longer? I don't know. I was wondering if Tony Khan's gonna license Wham's "Wake Me Up Before You Go Go" for his <laughs> entrance music. It was okay for what it was. We've never seen this guy before. It got a lot of people talking about the finish. Whether that's good or bad, that's another story. I, I mean, if he knocked him out in a minute, first move of the match, if he knocked him out, it looked like he really knocked him out. I wouldn't have a problem with that. He's a boxer. But it was, it was bleh. It didn't really look like he really knocked him out. I don't know. Um... Okay, here was a real test for, especially for you. Especially for you. Dax Harwood, the best in-ring performer they have in the company overall, against Chris Jericho, your favorite whipping boy. 
Could you put your personal feelings aside, Brian, like you always tell me about Harpo and about uh, the Cucamonga kids and Pockets and Dwarf Dong Sucker and all of them? Can you put your personal feelings aside for old Jericho here? It wasn't bad, was it? It wasn't bad. It wasn't the greatest. And I've always been honest about Jericho. When he's good, I say he's good. When he's sloppy and bad, I say he's sloppy and bad. And I've always done the same thing. It's just I've never seen those people that I mentioned actually. See that? <laughs> That's where you go too far. Uh, what I just, it God was, damn, I can't make shit up. I just report on it. But anyway. It was okay. Um, and obviously it was intentional. They put him in there, like you said. Dax has a reputation amongst us as being the one of the best workers in that company. He has that reputation there too. Yeah. So to put Jericho in the ring with him was, you know, intentional. I hate the whole booking of Inner Circle and Pinnacle. But that's another story, but it was a good match. You, well, could put, the, you could put Dax in there with anyone. And this isn't even a shot at Jericho, but you put Dax in there with anyone on that roster, they'll probably have the best match they could have on TV. I agree with that. and But at the same time, this is where this was a grudge match. Uh, and for the people who didn't see it, it was Dax Harwood against Jericho. Cash, they said all the rest of the inner circle and the pinnacle were barred, but Cash and Tully were out there with Dax, and Guevara was out there with Jericho, and Mike Tyson was the ringside enforcer, and they also had a referee. So they, they really only barred like six people out of both groups, and they'll show up in a minute. Um, the paid fans have gotten ridiculous with the overacting on the singing. I mean, that one redheaded douchebag looks like she's doing Shakespeare in the park over, oh, my God, alas, poor Yorick. <laughs> and notice they didn't show any fans in the crowd. It's a tape show. I don't know how many fans are actually there, but whoever was there obviously wasn't singing along as action-packed as the people there who we saw twice because, again, it's a tape show. The phony second chorus where they cut in the other clips of the people. The soundtrack sounded really loud. Um, and I, uh, uh, just an idle thought I had, if it's Dax the Axe, is it also then Cash the Smash? The demolition puns. Yeah, are, no, I know, I know, I'm not sure. Getting real close here. Um, but anyway, here's the thing. If they didn't do... This in every match, this is where it calls for it, and this is where it's meaningful. They did fight on the floor. They did have a brawl, because this is a grudge match. These are top guys. There's an issue between them. So, yes, then they can go to the floor. Then they can fight. It was a pretty good fight. It was refreshing to see after the first match, where you cannot believe that anybody's literally really mad at each other. Tyson, poor Mike Tyson was lost at ringside when guys would go around him and stuff that wasn't obviously laid out or planned or told about ahead of time. And he's like, you can see the, what the fuck do I do? Uh, but that's cause it's, it's not his world. Uh, they went through a break by the time they got back, Jericho was sucking wind, but he was hanging in there. He, I, I got to give him, give him credit. Uh, they had lots of back and forth. I love Dax's slingshot power bomb. That was very nice. And then suddenly the Cash interfered and Sammy Guevara just fucking flies and tackles him, gloms him out of nowhere. But then all the people who were barred at ringside from the inner circle and the pinnacle just all come out at the same time and instantly at the same time and get in a fight at ringside. If they're barred from... <laughs> what, they were just around the fucking curtain and we didn't notice those six... Fucking six foot plus 300 pound men or whatever the fuck. We didn't notice they were here. And they get in a big schmoz. And Tyson, as a matter of fact, did you see the shot Tyson hit fucking Cash with? Yeah. That should have been the boxer's knockout. They And, and, and maybe did they say, well, we'll make our boxer do a gut shot because we've also got Mike Tyson on the show and he's going to knock somebody out? I don't know. But if you'll notice, Tyson threw the fucking, he threw a flipper punch. He threw a punch that he could work. It was tight in there, but it was to the jaw from what you could tell, but he bent his fucking fist. So unless Cash tells me different, I don't think he hurt him, but it looked fucking good and it looked like a knockout punch. That's what old Anthony Agogo should have done, except then there's 
two boxers knocking out two people on the same show. I can't save their shitty similar booking, but you get the picture. Uh, but then suddenly Tyson knocked out Cash, and then Jericho hit the Judas on Dax, and we all knew he was going to. But uh, it was a good match. It was a good fight. And they got use out of Mike Tyson. You know, except for, as I said, two boxer knockouts in the same show, th there was nothing to matter with with this in in concept and mostly in execution. And again, they have blood and guts coming up, and it feels like there's no urgency in this program. It feels like they've already beaten the heels. Oh, yeah. Over. Well, no, I mean, there's the, 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 the there's nothing wrong with this segment. The program's over with. <laughs> I mean, that's, well, let's not get crazy. Once that the baby faces come back from a beating and the first thing they do is beat up everybody that beat them up and take the main instigator and flush his head in the toilet, there's no reason to have any rematches. You're done. Thank you for coming. But as far as a segment on television here, this was probably the best it could have been out of all of these fucking folks. And then Jericho indicted Tyson into the, into the inner circle. He's an associate member. Then we go to Barb Brady with Don Callis and the Goof Patrol. And I, I swear to God, what I'm about to tell you is not a lie. If I'm lying, I'm flying, and my feet have not left the ground. Because I like Don Callis's promos, although he's getting a little over the top and tongue-in-cheek uh, here himself. But as soon as I wrote this line, here's Don Callis trying to get these numb nuts over and right after I wrote that, Harpo joins in and says the word numb nuts in his phone sex fucking voice. Now they're, they're, <laughs> they've, they've got my notepad bugged. But they did a long interview, so now that they're heels, apparently we're going to have to listen to these fucking dipshits for an hour every week. And then Don Callis super kicks the cameraman. Was there any necessary reason that that had to happen when they had done for, for Don always does good promos and the other ones, you know, had done something serviceable. Harpo didn't hyperventilate. And then they have to do silly shit by super kicking the cameraman. It just, it's genetically in their fucking DNA that they cannot be serious about anything in it. Yes. It is in their DNA. All righty. The next match was Chris Statlander versus Amber Nova. I'll let you start out on this one, Brian. Well, since you likely skipped this match, I'll just say that I thought Chris Statlander looked good in there. It was short and to the point. Chris Statlander won. Did she hurt anybody else or herself? There were no reported injuries at this time. Okay, we'll keep a close eye on that. Did you notice earlier during the Bucks match... They had a section in the crowd with the four different tag teams sitting there watching. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, I forgot to write that down, but I mentioned that. Yeah, they have to make all the other tag teams go out there and sit and watch the executive vice president's cosplay to further demean the rest of them. You, were gonna, you brought that up I for some reason? I brought that up just because I thought of Statlander. She's now involved with the... Best friends. She's well, don't say, don't say it like that. She's now in the group of the best friends. I'm sure she's not involved with them. Because even a space alien has to have some standards. And besides that, as we mentioned, that would necessitate some of these children in this locker room trying to play with the little man in the boat instead of the big joystick. Uh, Team Taz was still waiting for Christian Cage. Did you know that? Still waiting for their answer. And Ricky Starks, frankly, is wondering why. And Brian Cage is also just not happy, and Taz tells both of them to stay out of the way. So, of course, everything's fine in Team Taz. But now, are they going to swerve us, and is Brian Cage going to end up not fucking breaking up with Team Taz, just being a malcontent who disagrees with all of them all the time, but nothing ever comes of it? I don't know. I mean, that basically is Team Taz. Nothing ever comes of it. I've enjoyed them. <laughs> I like Taz a lot. I like Ricky Starks a lot, but they never do anything. They're always interrupting someone's promos or doing a promo about how nothing's happening, but nothing ever happens. 
or being run off by senior citizens that come out in non-threatening manners. Well, anyway, um, basically, Taz tells Cage and Stark, stay out of the way. We're going to get Christian Cage's answer. Tony Schiavone, Tony Schiavanto is in the ring with Christian Cage. And 15 seconds into the promo, out comes Taz and Hook and Hobbs. Are you in or are you out? So let us handle it. Don't you guys get in the way. You're, what did he tell? They were too over the top. They were too bombastic, whatever. We'll handle this calmly. So the guy's out there speaking and 15 seconds in. So are you in or are you out? Um, and, and they love to use variations of the word shit since they've told apparently there's a number of times that they can say shit on the program and TNT won't be mad at them. So they dole out their shits and it's either full of shit or shit bag or whatever. It's kind of like the son of a bitches. You can get a couple of son of a bitches too. Um, suddenly Taz, because Cage don't, don't want none, Taz sours on him. Hobbs goes to the ring. They have a sloppy fight. Uh, they level Cage and rail him into the rail and get some heat on him. Nobody comes to help. No referees. None of the baby faces in the crowd that are just on the other side of the rail. No wrestlers come out. There's no bell ringing. There's the announcer is going, oh, this is terrible. But nobody uh, involved with this production in any way is trying to stop it as they just beat Christian Cage up until they're done and just walk off in front of God and everybody. Did this make a lot of sense? No. And again, no disrespect to him, but I've not cared at all about Christian Cage and AEW so far. I did get to thinking when I saw Hook out there, we haven't really seen Hook wrestle or do anything. Here's another forgotten feud. Didn't Hook he was being trained by Cody, and then Taz yeah. just immediately said, no, that's my son, and then nothing ever happened with any of that ever again. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, hey, yeah, you've been training my son, I want him back. And that was it. Okay. And then yeah. nothing ever happened. Yeah. Yep. All righty, then. Um, at least we're moving through this fairly quickly this week. For the television title, this was the main event. Matt Hardy versus Darby Allen. Not only no DQ, but falls count anywhere. Lazy booking. Up a lazy booker where the lazy bookers go. The lazy booker that I know so well. Huh. So it's... <sighs> It's no DQ and falls count anywhere. So Matt Hardy picks up a chair, comes in the ring with it in front of the referee, God and everybody, and just starts with the fucking chair. He swings and misses, and then he hits him with it, and he hits him four or five times with a chair, but never tries for a cover. So I, and I also, I knew that they couldn't go and at one entire television show without a garbage match. There's been no kendo sticks garbage cans tables ladders blah 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 they couldn't make it through two hours once upon a time matt hardy could have had a really good match with a guy like darby allen hand to hand in the ring they could have had the people the people on the edge of their seats they could have had a fucking barn burner of a match depending on which one was supposed to go over it could have gone either way. Guys could have come out looking good. Now, Matt, is it to hide physical limitations? He's got to do the indie garbage shit, or is it just that that's what he feels like they want here, and so there's no effort at trying to have a match with a guy? Now that he's a heel, that's all the more important why he could have a match with Darby Allen and teach Darby something. But instead, they just whack each other with goddamn constant use of the chair in front of the referee. I know it's no DQ, lazy booking. When you're doing it in front of the referee and he's just standing there accepting it, it's visually idiotic. Um, and, and they're really hitting each other, but it means nothing. So I that's what I don't know. Is it is it 
Matt's covering up his limitations. I can understand him trying to get by if that's the case, but it seems like this kind of match would be harder if you had physical limitations instead of a regular actual wrestling match. Um, then the butcher comes out and hits Darby Allen with a trash can in front of the referee and in the private party is gets on him. And then here comes the dork order and they have 18 people fighting all around the ring. And here comes sting, no snow. Well, the spring is here. Sting comes out with a bat but he's come. I saw him carrying the bat out, but seconds later, he's clotheslining, double clotheslining private party over the top rope. But they went to the break. This is not the end of the match. They went to a break in the match. The match is still going, but there's 18 people fighting at ringside, and the guys that are having the match are on the floor, and people not involved in the match are doing spots in the ring. And this is just the break point. So apparently they all fought through the break while Matt and Darby Allen were doing the fucking garbage indie spots on the outside of the ring. And then they come back and Hardy is covering Darby Allen on the floor somewhere in the arena. And the referee is counting a pin on the floor because it's falls count anywhere while Sting is in the ring, still beating the heels up. And then it's, as the dork order and the fucking hardy house heels have disappeared somewhere, there becomes Lance Archer, Scorpio Sky, and Ethan Page, that little fucking squirrel-faced prick, uh, arguing with each other on the ramp and talking to Sting and Sting and Archer are facing off. They're not in this match. The match is out on the floor somewhere, but this this is hurting my fucking head. And then when Sting and Archer had their face off, actually that's sad. They didn't they didn't hurt themselves. They 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 had their face off, meaning a stare down, not they ripped their own faces off. But on this program, anything's possible. Sting and Archer have a face off with each other, and Archer tells Sting, Well, I'll show you, and he goes and gives his finish to fucking one of the private party guys, Cassidy, out on that's over laying over on the side. So Archer hits his finish on Cassidy to piss Sting off in some fashion. This is the biggest clusterfuck that I have ever seen in the history of English speaking clusterfucks. And then Sting just walked off, and everybody else had left, and Hardy gave Alan a nut shot and gave him a twist of fate on the stage with a chair wrapped around his neck and covered him for a two count. And at that point, I looked at the clock and I had five minutes of this horse shit left and I said, I can't take anymore. And I just turned it off there. What the fuck else happened? Darby Allen won the match. It took five minutes for him to come back from having a twist of fate given to him on a stage while a chair was around his neck to come back and win that match. Eventually, he got a hold of Sting's bat. Oh, I'm sure he did. did some batting practice. Why did they have a no DQ Falls Count Anywhere match? The Matt Hardy, Darby Allen feud. So they could do all of that shit they did in it. But did anything lead up to that is what I'm saying. And I just can't remember. No, no. They they make up rules for matches specifically on an idea that the amateur booker has for what he wants to do in the match. It's not supposed to make sense, but it, that's they just make the rules so they can do that. When's the last time you watched a match where everybody in the ring doing spots and taking bumps was not involved in the match and the match was taking place out on the floor at the same time. So another thing about modern wrestling that I can't stand is the fucking amateurs that feel like, you know, if you're a billionaire and you want to buy a hospital, fine but don't ask to go in and start doing the heart surgeries. Find somebody that knows how to get in and out of the fucking heart. But I, I, I did no DQ falls count anywhere. And people were on me because of that three way. When I said the three way at WrestleMania, goddamn it. And it's no DQ too. everybody. Well, don't you know? 
three ways are always no disqualification. It's because all the bookers are fucking lazy. If all the bookers weren't lazy, you wouldn't be seeing that many three ways, and they sure as hell wouldn't be no disqualification. But I just can't. They're all the same. All of this shit is the same. No rules. No parameters. They do anything they want. It doesn't have to make sense. Garbage indie outlaw matches with guys doing stunts with furniture. I don't mind if people have a saloon fight where the furniture gets knocked over in the process of the fight. I oppose the idea of having a saloon fight when Marshall Dillon and the bad guy stop to place the furniture in the right place to fall through it when they have their fight. As just to use hyperbolic language in the interest only of comedic exaggeration and certainly not meant as a threat or legitimate wish to be taken seriously by either YouTube personnel or any government agency, I wish that every one of these no disqualification nitwits would get hit on the head or run over by a tractor trailer truck, possibly in front of their entire families, so hard that their brain matter and pieces of intestine would splatter all over their favorite ants that have heart conditions. But that's merely exaggeration. Oh, yeah. But a God, Jesus Christ. That's why there are no grudge matches, because every match is out of control from the start. So when people actually do have a fight, what are they supposed to do? Just pull out fucking bear mace and start spraying each other in the face at, at, at the bell? What'd you think of this thing at the end? I don't know what else to say. I was stoned, but I wasn't really into it. Two hours into the show? Boy, that must have been good shit. I may have, you know, taken a break during one of the matches to re-up. But, <laughs> you know, it just, again, I couldn't figure out what the big Darby Allen matt Hardy feud was that led to a Falls Can Anywhere match. And I just knew it would be just a chaos of run-ins at the end, and it's exactly what it was, and I knew Sting would walk out there, and it's exactly what it was. It wasn't even did. run-ins at the end, it was run-ins in the middle. In the middle, that's true. And then they all leave, and then they still are, they're still having a match. That's like, goddamn, why are you still fucking after everybody's left the orgy? And at this point, it's one thing when you're introducing him for a promo, but for Tony Schiavone to have to scream, it's Sting! Whenever he arrives, has gotten ridiculous. Well, now it's a rib that everybody tells Tony, oh, we love the way you do that. So he's, he's fucking with people. Every time he sees Sting, he feels like he's got, it's Sting! <sighs> All right. Well, that was hey, AEW. That was AEW. <sighs> Give me some Valter. I want some Valter. I vaunt to Valter. I vaunt to my Valter. He doesn't let you down. <laughs> so I sang Mary Jane last week, and you had some this week. That's right. I may do it again next week. I don't know. Maybe enjoy AEW a little bit more. You're Rick James, bitch. I don't... <laughs> to paraphrase Dutch Mantel, I don't know that black tar heroin would make me enjoy this program. But anyway, all right. I don't think black tar heroin would, based on the knowledge I have from reading books about heroin. I would never fuck around with that. However, the right sativa would probably put you in a little bit more of an uplifting mood to watch the Young Bucks flip and zip and dip around. I have a feeling that if I had to watch even the Cucamonga kids under such a parameter as that, that I would disprove the theory that people never engage in mass murder while high on marijuana. Give me a nice fucking bazooka, a couple of hand grenades. <laughs> what? Get me close enough to fucking Cucamonga. All, All right. right. Let's, All right. Before we get pulled anyway. off here. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'd blow a big hole in the ground and make them a nice new landfill. That's what I'd do with all those explosives. I'd do something to improve the town. Nice big hole in the ground where they could put all their garbage. Anyway, I'm trying to close this up. Uh, what are we going to do next week? We don't know yet, do we? It'll be a big week here It'll on the show. The drive through on Tuesday, and of course the experience when it debuts next Saturday. And as 
more than likely a chance someone in wrestling will do something incredibly stupid. And you can hear all about it right here on the That's experience. right. That's that's right. That's a that's a safe bet almost all the time. And uh and action figures are coming out. Coming out regularly. And uh, by the way, Bree's on vacation this coming week. So I'm I've I've already made my backup plans and they're gonna be taking care of me. They know I'm coming. So uh uh action figure customers have faith. It can happen to you. And otherwise, if you are a devoted listener and we thank you for it, then devote yourself on out of here until next week and come back and listen to us again. And in parting, we want to wish you love, peace, and soul. And thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>